nation's history, which beyond the needless harm inflicted on effective government employees, contractors, and other businesses also hurt our economy and outlook. However, uh, this president declared a trade war on allies and enemies alike, leveling tariffs on steel and aluminum and threatening to rip up other deals. His trade war is bringing down consumer and business sentiment. His tax scam, which was a giveaway to the wealthy in corporate America, is slated to reduce government revenue by $1.8 trillion over the next 10 years. Each of these actions by a Trump uh, administration uh, were noted in the minutes of the Fed's January policy meetings and appear to have, may have weighed in on the Fed's decision to pause further interest rate increases. In the midst of what some fear is slowing growth, the administration's economic policies are fueling the fire of a possible downturn. It is critical that the Federal Reserve remain vigilant in protecting this economy. The last matter I want to raise pertains to the Federal Reserve's apparent efforts um, to modify Dodd-Frank safeguards Congress and your predecessors at the Fed put in place following the financial crisis. In particular, I'm concerned uh, that the Fed is following some of the uh, Trump Treasury Department's deregulation roadmap, the regulatory roadmap, to weaken the capital and liquidity buffers on some of the largest banks. This is particularly troubling given that many economists including many at the Federal Reserve, believe that bank capital levels are at the lower level, lower end of where they should be to weather another downturn. Banks earned a record $236.7 billion in annual profits in 2018. The largest six banks alone raked in over $120 billion. Given these record profits, uh, I do not believe there's a need for the Fed to further require capital and liquidity requirements. If anything, uh, given your concerns about the economy, now is not the time to take the guardrails off of this industry. The Fed should also be concerned with the growing uh, economic inequality in this country. In 2016, the Fed survey of consumer finances stated that the top 1% of U.S. families own 38.6% of the wealth. The Minneapolis Federal Reserve Bank reported that over the last 70 years, virtually no progress has been made in reducing income and wealth inequalities between black and white households. So I would urge you and the Federal Reserve to work to tackle the scourge of economic inequality. And so I know that we just had a moment to talk about some of these issues, and you have uh, some information you shared with us just recently about some of the concerns that I have raised, and you may want to talk about those a little bit uh, today. So I look forward to your testimony and to discussing these matters with you. And so the chair now recognize, uh, recognizes the ranking member of the committee, the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. McHenry, for four minutes for an opening statement. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman Waters. Uh, thank you, Chairman Powell. Uh, since uh, his confirmation last year as Fed Chairman, Mr. Powell has prioritized outreach to Congress and public disclosure of Fed activities. Uh, and members and the public have benefited from uh, that outreach and that uh, public-facing interaction. I'm hopeful that the chairman will continue to pursue this approach as it is important for the long-term integrity of the institution and highlights the uh, open book approach uh, to Fed policy that is necessary for long-term market stability and understanding of Fed policymaking. The economy over the last two and a half years has witnessed remarkable growth and unemployment has reached lows that many once believed were impossible. Republican-led efforts for tax relief and regulatory reform have supported these trends, with millions of Americans benefiting uh, uh, through those policies, as a result of those policies, uh, and millions more seeing their wages grow as a result of that regulatory right-sizing and tax relief. The Fed's interest uh, in undertaking targeted rulemaking to provide regulatory right-sizing will help continue that trend. And it's important to economic growth and stability for the pace to be picked up. At the same time, I share the Fed's concerns that global economic uncertainty 
could prove challenging here at home. As uh, the minutes of the last uh, FOMC meeting made clear, Europe and China in particular represent risks the Fed should continue to monitor and, where appropriate, work to mitigate. In Europe, the specter of a no-deal Brexit not only impacts the EU-UK trading relationship, but also entails spillover effects that may implicate domestic financial institutions here at home. Further afield, chronic weakness in Italy remains a threat to Eurozone economies, and new movements have emerged that seek to disrupt the, uh, the continent's um, post-war politics as well. As for China, the days of double-digit growth appear to be gone, but not Beijing's misguided state-run economic management. China continues to suffer from the politicized allocation of capital, the cynicism towards international economic governance standards, opaque channels for decision-making, and, of course, the absence of the rule of law. In some, China poses a massive risk, but a risk that defies conventional forms of assessment because its regime lacks conventional forms of accountability and transparency. In both China and Europe, we are facing systemic risks that uh, have few historic analogies. China's growth is expected to decline to its lowest point since 1990, and European Union membership has only expanded, never shrunk, since its origins more than a half century ago. These are different times we're living through and different challenges, certainly for the Fed and for the Fed chair. That means that the rearview mirror will be of limited usefulness for policymakers in the, year ahead, in the years ahead. We'll need to confront new sources of uncertainty with new insights and ideas, and the Fed will be essential in detecting and interpreting these challenges. While some of Mr. Ch uh, Mr. Powell's predecessors developed a reputation for ambiguity, I'm hopeful that he will pursue a different path, and it's certain that he already has. Uh, as he himself has noted last month, greater uncertainty calls for more clarity from the Fed, not less. In the face of risks that we've yet to fully understand, our central bank must be all the more articulate and predictable. The chair now recognizes <coughs> the subcommittee chair, Mr. Cleaver, for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for being here today. Uh, some of what I'd like to focus on uh, in this short amount of time is what I've uh, spoken about with you in the casual conversations, uh, but I intend to say it uh, quite openly today, and, uh, and it is this, that the imperative that uh, the Federal Reserve remain independent uh, as it works to fulfill its mandate of maximum uh, employment and price stability is key. Uh, I do hope that the Fed is able to resist uh, the clamor of political murmurings and uh, not allow that to drown out uh, the critical deliberations that the Fed uh, must have in order to uh, head up our uh, monetary policy in this country. Uh, the level of politicization and explicit pressure uh, that you, the Federal Reserve members, uh, have received uh, is unprecedented and unnecessary. Uh, Madam Chair, thank you. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. The Chair now recognizes the subcommittee ranking member, Mr. Stivers, for one minute. Thank you, Chairman Waters, for holding this here. Chairman Powell, thank you for being here today. Uh, we're all looking forward to your testimony. Uh, it's, it's a really important time, as you know, uh, for your dual mandate, and we finally, through some policies of tax cuts and regulatory reform, achieved an economic growth rate in the 3 to 4 percent range. We have unemployment at about 4 percent. But uh, I've got a gift for you to remind you of your dual mandate. Mark's going to bring it to you. It's a 100,000 Venezuelan Boulevard note, and uh, as you know, uh, their inflation rate's about 65,000 uh, percent, or was, and it's still growing. Um, and they have people starving in one of the most resource-risk countries in the world. Um, we and 300 million Americans are depending on you to continue your stable, hard work to give us full employment and stable prices, Mr. Chairman, and I look forward to talking to you today. I'd like to welcome to the committee our distinguished witness, Jerome Powell. 
Chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank System. He has served on the Board of Governors since 2012 and as its chair since 2017. Mr. Powell has testified before the committee, and I believe he does not need any further introduction. Without objection, your written statement will be made part of the record. Mr. Powell, you are now recognized to present your oral testimony. Thank you and good morning. Uh, Chair Waters, Ranking Member McHenry, and other members of the committee, I'm happy to present the Federal Reserve's semi-annual monetary policy report to the Congress. Let me start by saying that my colleagues and I strongly support the goals Congress has set for monetary policy, maximum employment and price stability. We are committed to providing transparency about the Federal Reserve's policies and programs. Congress has entrusted us with an important degree of independence so that we can pursue our mandate without concern for short-term political considerations. We appreciate that our independence brings with it the need to provide transparency so that Americans and their representatives in Congress understand our policy actions and can hold us accountable. We are always grateful for opportunities such as today's hearing to demonstrate the Fed's deep commitment to transparency and accountability. Today, I will review the current economic situation and outlook for, before turning to monetary policy. I will also describe several recent improvements to our communications practices to enhance our transparency. The economy grew at a strong pace on balance last year, and employment and inflation remain close to the Federal Reserve's statutory goals. Based on the available data, we estimate that Gross domestic product rose a little less than 3% last year, following a 2.5% increase in 2017. Last year's growth was led by strong gains in consumer spending and increases in business investment. Growth was supported by increases in employment and wages, optimism among households and businesses, and fiscal policy actions. In the last couple of months, some data have softened, but still point to spending gains this quarter. While the partial government shutdown created significant hardship for government workers and many others, the negative effects on the economy are expected to be fairly modest and to largely unwind over the next several months. The job market uh, remains strong. Monthly job gains averaged 223,000 in 2018, and payrolls increased an additional 304,000 in January. The unemployment rate stood at 4% in January, a very low level by historical standards, and job openings remain abundant. Moreover, the ample availability of job opportunities appears to have, have encouraged some people to join the workforce and some who otherwise might have left to remain in the workforce. As a result, the labor force participation rate for people in their prime working years, that is ages 25 to 54, who are either working or actively looking for work, has continued to increase over the past year. And in another welcome development, we are seeing signs of stronger wage growth. The job market gains in recent years have benefited a wide range of families and individuals. Indeed, recent wage gains have been strongest for lower skilled workers. That said, disparities persist, persist across various groups of workers and different parts of the country. For example, unemployment rates for African Americans and Hispanics are still well above the jobless rates for whites and Asians. Likewise, the percentage of the population with a job is noticeably lower in rural communities than in urban areas, and that gap has widened over the past decade. The February Monetary Policy Report provides additional information on employment disparities between rural and urban areas. Overall, consumer price inflation, as measured by the 12-month change in the price index for personal consumption expenditures, is estimated to have been 1.7 percent in December held down by recent declines in energy prices. Core PCE inflation, which excludes food and energy prices and tends to be a better indicator of future inflation, is estimated at 1.9 percent. At our January meeting, my colleagues and I generally expected economic activity to expand at a solid pace, albeit somewhat slower than in 2018, and the job market to remain strong. Recent declines in energy prices will likely push headline inflation further below the FOMC's longer-run goal of 2 percent for a time. But aside from those transitory effects, we expect that inflation will run close to 2 percent. 
While we view current economic conditions as healthy and the economic outlook as favorable, over the past few months we have seen some cross-currents and conflicting signals. Financial markets have become more volatile toward year-end, and financial conditions are now less supportive of growth than they were earlier last year. Growth has slowed in some major foreign economies, particularly China and Europe, and uncertainty is elevated around several unresolved government policy issues, including Brexit and ongoing trade negotiations. We will carefully monitor these issues as they evolve. In addition, our nation faces important longer-run challenges. For example, productivity growth, which is what drives rising real wages and living standards over the longer term, has been too low. Likewise, in contrast to 25 years ago, labor force participation among prime-age men and women is now lower in the United States than most other advanced economies. Other longer-run trends, such as relatively stagnant incomes for many families and a lack of upward economic mobility among people with lower incomes, also remain important challenges. And it is widely agreed that federal government debt is on an unsustainable path. As a nation, addressing these pressing issues could contribute greatly to the longer-run health and vitality of the United States economy. Over the second half of 2018, as the labor market kept strengthening and economic activity continued to expand strongly, the FOMC gradually moved interest rates toward levels that are more normal for a healthy economy. Specifically, at our September and December meetings, we decided to raise the target range for the federal funds rate by one quarter percentage point at each, putting the current range at two and a quarter to two and a half percent. At our December meeting, we stressed that the extent and timing of any further rate increases would depend on incoming data and the evolving outlook. We also noted that we, that we would be paying close attention to global economic and financial developments and assessing their implications for the outlook. In January, with inflation pressures muted, the FOMC determined that the cumulative effect of these developments, along with ongoing government policy uncertainty, warranted taking a patient approach with regard to future policy changes. Going forward, our policy decisions will continue to be data dependent and will take into account new information as economic conditions and the outlook evolve. For guideposts on appropriate policy, the FOMC routinely looks at monetary policy rules that recommend a level for the federal funds rate based on measures of inflation and the cyclical position of the U.S. economy. The February monetary policy report gives an update on monetary policy rules. I continue to find these rules to be helpful benchmarks, but of course no simple rule can adequately capture the full range of factors the committee must assess in conducting policy. We do, however, conduct monetary policy in a systematic manner, systematic manner to promote our long-run goals of maximum employment and stable prices. As part of this approach, we strive to communicate clearly about our monetary policy decisions. We've also continued to gradually shrink the size of our balance sheet by reducing our holdings of Treasury and agency securities. Federal Reserve's total assets declined about $310 billion since the middle of last year and currently stand at close to $4 trillion. Relative to their peak in 2014, banks' reserve balances with the Federal Reserve have declined by around $1.2 trillion, a drop of more than 40 percent. In light of the substantial progress we've made in reducing reserves and after extensive deliberations, the committee decided at our January meeting to continue over the longer run to implement policy with our current operating procedure. That is, we will continue to use our administered rates to control the policy rate with an ample supply of reserves so that active management of reserves is not required. Having made this decision, the committee can now evaluate the appropriate, appropriate timing and approach for the end of balance sheet runoff. I would note that we are prepared to adjust any of the details for completing balance sheet normalization in light of economic and financial developments. In the longer run, the size of the balance sheet will be determined by demand for Federal Reserve liabilities, particularly currency and bank reserves. The February Monetary Policy Report describes these uh, liabilities and reviews the factors that influence their size over the longer run. I'll, I'll conclude by mentioning some further progress we've made in improving transparency. Late last year, we launched two new publications. The first, our Financial Stability Report, shares our assessment of the resilience of the U.S. financial system, and the second, the Supervision and Regulation Report, provides information about our activities as a bank supervisor and regulator. 
Last month, we began conducting press conferences after every FOMC meeting instead of every other one. The change will allow me to more fully and more frequently explain the committee's thinking. Last November, we announced a plan to conduct a comprehensive review of the strategies, tools, and communications practices we use to pursue our congressionally assigned goals for monetary policy. This review will include outreach to a broad range of stakeholders across the country. The February Monetary Policy Report provides further discussion of these initiatives. Thank you very much. I'll be happy to respond to your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Powell. Uh, last Congress, I and other Democrats warned that S-2155, which Republicans claim to be a bill to benefit community banks, was in fact a broader deregulatory giveaway to large banks that would fuel mergers, accelerate industry, consolidation, and make it more difficult for community banks uh, to compete. Now, we have SunTrust and BB bb and t proposing to merge and become the sixth largest bank. Furthermore, even though banks made record profits of $237 billion last year, you said yesterday implementing S2155 was your highest priority, and the Fed has made several proposals that would reduce bank capital and liquidity reserves for our largest banks. Board Governor Brainerd voted against these proposals, noting the Fed's tailoring proposal would reduce high-quality liquid assets held by large banks about $70 billion. The FDIC originally opposed the Fed's leverage proposal as it would reduce bank capital by more than $120 billion. The Fed is also looking at making stress testing more transparent, which could undermine the purpose of the test. And former Fed Chair Fisher has called, called these deregulatory efforts, quote, something I find extremely worse, quote, unquote. So Chairman Powell, please explain. Will easing big bank capital and liquidity requirements as the Treasury Department has proposed, and your agency appears to be following through with, not undermine safeguards that are carefully built up the last decade to protect our economy, and which made the U.S. framework the gold standard that others around the world follow? Should we expect to see further industry consolidation if deregulating big banks is a top priority for the Federal Reserve? It was discussed in the Senate Banking Committee yesterday, how the Fed has accelerated its merger reviews and appears to be rubber stamping them. SunTrust, bb and claim their proposed merger will be approved by September, but can you assure us that the Fed will not rush the process, consult with all affected parties, hold field hearings, and focus on the public's interest, even if it means rejecting the application? The OCC unilaterally released an advance notice of proposed rulemaking to modernize the Community Reinvestment Act, or CRA. The Fed and the FDIC did not join that release. I was troubled to see Comptroller uh, Oding recently said that if he could not reach agreement with your two agencies, the OCC would go on its own with CRA reform. Would that be a good outcome? Could two different CRA regimes lead to regulatory arbitrage by banks? And lastly, a minute on diversity. I believe diversity in the Federal Reserve's leadership, including at the Reserve Banks, is crucial because it is hard to stay committed to all communities in the country when the leadership lacks an understanding of those communities that comes from uh, experience. That is why I and so many uh, on this side of the aisle have encouraged you to continually push to diversify in order to more closely represent the American public. The Center for Popular Democracy recently found that the current board directors are 76% banking or business, 74% white, and 62% male. They also cite that in 2013, 12 of the 105 board directors were African-American. 
That number has increased to 22 out of 108 today. This is an improvement, but it still does not look good. Federal Reserve Governor Brainerd recently spoke about increasing diversity efforts through a better pipeline at the inaugural, uh, that is, Sadie T.M. Alexander Conference in economics over the weekend. Right now, even before a search is underway for new directors, how is the Fed Reserve trying to build a pipeline for more diverse candidates? When you meet with Reserve Bank leaderships, how are you encouraging a focus on increasing director diversity? Why do you believe increasing diversity is a challenge? In your testimony, again, you stated that current economic conditions are healthy and the economic outlook favorable, but noted that over the past few months, quote, uncertainty is elevated around several unresolved government policy issues, end quote. I won't put it as delicate as you have. President Trump's policies are damaging. Our economy are challenging growth. This is why you've had to pause rate hikes. This lack of an economic agenda that changes with the wind is presenting market volatility and incredible consumer and business uncertainty. You've said just yesterday that uncertainty is the enemy of business. That is why former Federal Reserve Chair Janet Yellen says the president doesn't understand macroeconomic policy. If he did, he'd understand that only a stable, inclusive, economic agenda will support an even economic expansion. So Chairman Powell, the president is engaged in a trade war with an uncertain outcome that seems to change every other week. He has also forced the longest government shutdown in our nation's history. How are these actions affecting the U.S. economy in your estimation? How can you continue to achieve full employment and stable prices if this erratic economic agenda persists? Lastly, on monetary policy. In the minutes released uh, for the January 29-30 uh, FOMAC policy meeting, participants discussed moving forward with monetary policy while having a large uh, balance sheet. And what can be seen as a course change from the gradual balance sheet reduction that began in October 2017, the FOMAC now noticed that it is likely to stop reducing the balance sheet, which now stands at approximately $3.9 trillion. I believe in correct, correct, correct me if I'm wrong, the thought is to allow the gradual reduction to continue until FOMAC is comfortable with the size of the still elevated balance sheet later in the year. In an interest rate environment where the Fed funds rate is still low between 2.25 and 2.50 percent, how is the FOMAC likely to use the large balance sheet as a monetary policy tool in the case of an unexpected downturn? For instance, San Francisco Federal Reserve Bank President Mary Daly has suggested that you could use your balance sheet as a regular monetary policy tool. Does this mean that uh, QE could become routine in this low interest rate environment? If so, does this entail buying securities as the Fed did during the financial crisis and at a similar size and pace, or could you consider smaller uh, scale purchases and types of securities? Uh, with that, um, I will now recognize the distinguished ranking member, Mr. McHenry, for five minutes for questions. Good morning. <laughs> Chairman Powell, I have a series of questions for you, and I'd love to have your answers on these questions. You testified yesterday uh, regarding um, the, the bank's balance sheet, which stands at roughly $4 trillion. Um, and you, you gave a, an answer about sort of normalizing the balance sheet and what your view of that normalization looks like. <clears throat> um, and you referenced the demand for, for reserves as a, as a reference point for that. Can you elaborate on that? Sure, I'd, I'd be glad to. Um, so before the financial crisis, uh, the size of the Fed's balance sheet was a function of demand for our liabilities, principally currency and to a far less extent uh, reserves. Quantitative easing comes along. We hit the zero lower bound. The, the Fed buys a lot of assets. That was about buying assets. And um, 
the size of the balance sheet as a percent of GDP went from 6% to 25%. And that was really driven by a desire to buy longer-term credit assets, or rather federal, federal government debt, and drive down long-term interest rates. So now we're, now we're normalizing the balance sheet, and normalizing it really means going back to a situation where the size of the balance sheet is driven by demand for our liabilities, which has evolved, so currency and reserves mainly. So what's happened is demand for currency has grown, currency has outstanding has grown much faster than the economy, and demand for reserves is now much higher than it was because, um, because really we, requ we require banks to hold very high levels of high quality liquid assets, and they choose to hold reserves. So we can't go back to that very small balance sheet. So we're, we're, what we think is that, uh, it, you know, the committee's been working on this uh, carefully for the last three FOMC meetings and devising a plan. We're close to agreeing on a plan which would lay out, would sort of light the and, way to the end of the process. And do you plan to communicate that? Very that much. That plan? So. Yes, we do. Uh, when, it, when it's agreed, we've, we've found it's good to be very careful with, uh, with the balance sheet and but your reference point was about a trillion dollars in bank reserves at the Fed would be the reference point for uh, when you sort of end the, the, the reduction of the balance sheet. So we, um, there's tremendous... Do you have a time frame on that? Yes, you, uh, uh, there's, there's, there's a lot of uncertainty around the actual level. The, uh, what I did was I cited public estimates and said those appear reasonable. We actually don't know what the equilibrium demand will be. We're going to have to find it over time. Okay. And my guess is we'll be announcing something fairly soon. So in light of yesterday's housing figures, uh, which housing starts fell the lowest uh, number in more than two years, what impact do, do those um, housing figures from yesterday have in your timing uh, on, uh, on holding rates steady? Or do they have any impact? Um, so in terms of uh, what we said is we're going to be patient uh, and watch as the economy evolves and also as the, the evolving risk picture uh, changes and, and how that affects the uh, af will affect the the outlook, and we'll be looking at a, a full range of data. It would include housing starts. It would include anything that can affect our achievement of the dual mandate, pr principally growth, and then of course the, the labor markets and inflation. So we'll be looking at a wide range of data. That's one piece of it, uh, but uh, it's one of many pieces. So uh, it related to that, housing finance reform. Uh, you know, uh, Fannie and Freddie are more than a decade into nationalization. Uh, you're, uh, you uh, are a major holder. The Fed is a major holder of these assets. Uh, do you think that it's, it's important for Congress to prioritize housing finance reform for the American economy? I do. I very much do. This is a big unfinished piece of business uh, for, for sort of the post-crisis era, and I think it would be good for the economy and, and, and uh, to move to a system where a lot of private capital is there supporting housing risk again, and it's not just all uh, winding up on the federal balance sheet. Okay, pivoting to result of uh, some recent statements. Um, you know, there are a lot of cross-currents, conflicting signals in, in the terminology you have, you, the Fed has used in the U.S. economy, in the global economy. Um, how do you respond to those who say you're making uh, financial market stability an unofficial mandate to the Fed's decision making? No, I wouldn't say that's, uh, that's what we're doing. First, I, I think um, financial stability has been part of the Fed's role. In fact, it really was our original role. Central banks generally evolved uh, out of a desire to support the stability of the financial system. It's always been something that we've done. Our mandate from you is, uh, is maximum employment and stable prices. That is the mandate. We also look after financial stability, and particularly as it, as it supports but the dual Financial market. stability, but not necessarily stock market stability. No. By financial stability, we're really talking about the, the capacity of the financial system, particularly banks, but other aspects of the financial system, to, to perform their role and intermediate between savers and borrowers and support economic activity. So what do you, what do you say to those folks who claim there's now a pow put on the market? Or so in the market. Anything, anything that matters for the dual mandate matters for us, and financial conditions, our, our, our tools work through financial conditions. So I would say that when there are um, uh, major changes in broader financial conditions, as you point out, not any one market or set of markets, but when they're for a sustained, sustained period, important changes in broader financial conditions, that matters for the macroeconomy, it matters for achievement of the dual mandate. And we'll, of course, take that into account. So you mentioned the headwinds internationally, uh, the softening in the EU, uh, the softening in the Chinese economy, the, the risk of Brexit. 
we see what's happening internationally for, for uh, 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 global um, uh, terror and things of that sort. But I want to talk specifically about China and ask you about this. Um, so how does China's use of state-run state banks to allocate credit affect financial stability for the rest of the world? I don't know that there are important implications for global financial stability. Uh, it is a part of their system. I mean, they're, they're, I know they're, they're trying to move, move to a more market-based system over time, and that's, uh, that's a challenging, challenging transition. So more to this point, it's an opaque market. So getting numbers and getting a solid understanding of that allocation of capital is much more difficult in China than it is in, in the rest of the first world, is it not? That's right. Uh, that, that's right. Uh, so in, in addition, um, uh, you know, so much of their e economic activity, in effect, has the backing of the central government. So uh, let, let me just wrap up with a broader, converse, uh, broader question. You mentioned our national debt. Uh, the debt and deficit challenge is a real one. Uh, I firmly believe we've got to uh, right-size our spending, uh, commensurate with long-run obligations that we have to the American people. Uh, but fundamentally, our deficit does have an impact on your dual mandate, does it not? I would say in the longer run. In the longer run. And, and our national debt, too, in the longer run, has an impact in Fed policymaking as it, as, as it results in uh, stability and full employment, does it not? You know, I, I would say the unsustainable path of the federal government is, is a, a longer run problem. It doesn't really affect, uh, w most of our thinking is about business cycle frequencies and, um, you know, supporting the economy when it's weak and holding it back when it's overheating. Um, but that, that's, that's just in general uh, and uh, not so much about uh, fiscal unsustainability, but we, we worry about in the longer run what what will happen is we'll wind up spending our money on interest payments rather than on the things we really need. Yield back. Thank you very much, um, uh, Mr. Chairman. As you answer the questions, they will be overlapping. Feel free to expound on some of the questions that I put before you. I took up all the time, and I didn't give you an opportunity to, to answer those questions. But as you answer questions from the others, feel free uh, to include in those uh, answers uh, some of those concerns. Now the gentlelady uh, from New York, uh, Ms. Velasquez, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Chairman Powell, thank you so very much for being here today. I have heard from several constituencies who have, who have expressed concern about the impact the current expected credit loss methodology could have on lending to consumers and small businesses. They tell me the proposal, while well intended, could be more pro pro-cyclical than the current incurred loss method, especially in a downturn, and would disproportionately impact consumer lending and LMI borrowers, who, as you know, can least afford an increase in the cost of credit or a complete loss altogether. Much of the talk thus far has been about accounting policy, but what about economic policy? Has the Fed conducted a review of the economic impact of CISL, particularly in a downturn? So we, um, we've tried to uh, think carefully about the, the questions that have been raised by, uh, by banks about this. And um, we've thought a lot about this over time. We've tried to work with banks so that they'll be able to implement this FASB decision in ways that are, uh, that are not too disruptive and too expensive and too complicated. We've also uh, allowed banks to start a three-year fa phase-in of this beginning, I guess, next year. So we're, we're doing everything we can to, um, to avoid a, you know, a, a big change that's disruptive to lending. Um, and you know, in, in addition, we will be watching carefully to see w what the actual results are. But, Mr. Chairman, I am not concerned about how the banks will be handling this. I am concerned about the economic impact that it could have on mortgages for a segment of our population who is already, um, who has been um, not participating in capital access, such as low-income borrowers or 
um, small businesses? Have you conducted uh, any economic impact on that? Because I know that as talk in their uh, December meeting discussion, they discuss this issue. Yes. Had you? We'll, we'll, we will, we're aware of those concerns and we'll be watching to see whether there's any such effect. We don't expect that there'll be such an effect, but we'll be watching carefully to see. Um, Chairman Powell, you recently gave a speech <clears throat> at Mississippi Valley State University that address economic uh, development challenges in rural areas. While New York City is certainly not rural, I believe many of the challenges you spoke about could also apply to urban centers, particularly those of color. In that speech, you noted the importance of workforce training due to the loss of key industries and the resulting mismatch between the skill of local workers and those demanded by new employers. As federal banking regulators contemplate updating CRA regulations, should banks receive CRA credit for supporting or participating in such workforce development programs? Uh, that's a good question, and I, I don't know how, I don't know whether that would get CRA credit or not. It's certainly, I was speaking at a conference that was looking at basically broad measures to alleviate poverty, and uh, I'll, I'll check into that and come back to you. Thank you. Um, recently, and uh, the chair already uh, alluded to this, recently Comptroller Odin said that he was hopeful that all three bank regulators will jointly propose CRA reforms by the summer. But he also indicated that if you were not all able to agree, the OCC will be willing to propose the reforms on its own. This is counter to statements made recently by Governor Brainer, where she stated that federal regulator, regulators should speak with one voice on CRA. What is your view? I think ideally we would like to have a unified view. It would be better for, uh, to, to have one agreed upon framework for CRA. That, that, that's obviously the, the best outcome and we're gonna be working toward that. But I, I would wanna add though that, you know, we're, we're very committed at the Fed to, uh, to the mission of CRA and, um, you know, we're looking to make it more effective. Should there be a joint rulemaking and do you believe the Fed will ultimately sign onto the OCC's proposal? We'll have to see. I, I, I think it would be ideal for the three regulators to get together and we're working you know, with the other two agencies on that, I think the goal is to get to a joint, uh, a joint answer. I yield back. The gentleman from Oklahoma is recognized for five minutes, Mr. Lucas. Thank you, Chairwoman. Uh, Chairman Powell, thank you for being here today, and I believe that my colleagues will do an outstanding job of covering the broader issues uh, and with a number of inquiries. So, as has been my custom in recent years, I'd like to focus in on some particular issues. And if we could, uh, once again, converse about the joys of derivatives, so to speak. My questions will deal with those uh, issues that are within the Fed's role. First, turning to an issue I've raised several times, which is inter-affiliate margin. As you know, transactions between affiliates are risk management tools and do not expose counterparties to each other's risk. I have pushed with my colleagues on the Ag Committee to exempt those inter-affiliate transactions from initial margin requirements. The CFT, CFTC and European regulators agree with me, and yet the Fed hasn't changed its policy to be consistent with those regulations when it comes to bank swap dealers. Now, I understand these issues predate your tenure, but uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to know if you intend to administratively pursue a more risk-reflective approach on initial margin for inter-affiliate swaps. Um, I know we haven't made a decision on that, I, but we are looking at the inter-affiliate uh, margin question, and we'll come back to you on that. And hopefully that's something perhaps in the near view as opposed to the longer view, perhaps, Mr. Chairman? Yes, I think sir. that's a leading question, so to speak. Yeah. That's a yes. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Now, speaking frankly, I hear a lot of good things uh, from both you and Mr. Quarles on this issue, and I appreciate that very much. But the lack of formal action still concerns me, and I think it's time to quickly move on to this. These rules currently capture a whopping $38.8 billion in capital for transactions that are not inherently risky. And I would certainly ask you and your staff to, to move forward soon on this, uh, please. Now, 
Moving to something else I raised with Mr. Quarles last year in this space, you are currently engaged in a joint comment period with the OCC and the FDIC about uh, SACAR and, or the SACAR proposal. That framework asked to hear from other industry stakeholders about the need for an offset for client margin in the supplemental leverage ratio. If I may, I'd like to offer you a few thoughts here. The number of firms providing clearing services have declined from 88 to 55. This affects farmers and ranchers and other end users in derivative markets. They are steadily losing options for clearing activity. This part of the SLR uh, contributes to the closing of these markets to folks I mentioned. For what it's worth, the CFTC commissioners agree with me and have submitted a joint comment raising the same concerns. Now, Mr. Chairman, I know I can't ask you to comment on any action now uh, considering the recent extension of the comment period, but as you proceed through this comment period, I'd like to make sure you know about those concerns and that you'd be able to take my concerns into consideration as you move through that joint comment process. So we are in the process of reviewing the comments, as you point out. Thank you. I have one more note, Mr. Chairman, on the SACR proposal. I understand that the framework would significantly uh, raise the capital requirements for over-the-counter unmargined swaps. As you know, Congress was very explicit in allowing non-financial end users to continue trading in the OTC market. We were this explicit to, in making hedging affordable uh, to the entities. I'm concerned that a significant increase in capital requirements associated with these swaps will make them far more expensive, and this would of course, frustrate congressional intent. In particular, it's my understanding that the capital requirements will essentially be high for commodity derivatives, such as those used to hedge oil and natural gas costs. Where I'm from, access to risk management products for energy and ag sectors are critical, and I want to make sure that we don't come under pressure by way of uh, excessive requirements imposed on those bank counterparties. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I've spent a lot of time on these issues, as you know, and I very much appreciate it if you'd be willing to bear these concerns in mind, which are shared by the end user community uh, as we move forward. I've always found you to be a practical person, and I like to think that I use my time and efforts to address practical issues that impact uh, not only my economy back home in Oklahoma, but the whole country. And with that, uh, unless you have a thought, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back the balance of my time. You're back, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Sherman, the gentleman from California, is recognized for five minutes. First, in responding to the ranking member, I think it's important that Fannie and Freddie continue to be what they have become, perhaps accidentally, and that is federal government agencies. We need a federal backstop in terms of credit risk, but never again should we have a semi-public, semi-private agency where taxpayers take the risk and shareholders uh, try to reap the profit. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate your patience on not raising rates. Um, you have a twin mandate, but I'm going to ask you to also consider an additional factor, not as important as your twin mandate, and that is the profit that you create as a byproduct of your efforts uh, at times turning over to the Treasury as much as $100 billion or nearly $100 billion in a single year. And I want you in your decisions to reflect on the fact that that's not just a dry accounting entry. It's life and death. We have limited amounts of money that we can spend here in Congress on cancer research, on body armor for our troops and research to make it better, on opioid programs, so people will live or die based upon whether you are able, as you have in the past, to turn over nearly $100 billion of uh, unintended profit. Uh, and I realize that's not your mandate, but it is life and death. Um, we talked uh, at, a, at another meeting about wire transfer fraud, and I'll get you some background material on that. But I do want to uh, talk uh, uh, to just focus the committee on the fact that people are being tricked through the internet to wire their funds into a particular numbered account, thinking they're sending the money to, say, the person they're buying a house from, and instead it's going somewhere else. So if we have a confirmation of payee system like the British, uh, we can avoid much of that. Uh, 
As to your balance sheet shrinkage, that diminishes your profit that you can turn over. It also, as you sell off or allow to run off uh, uh, your uh, mortgage-backed securities, you're raising mortgage costs for, for people. Your testimony said we have a good job market. It's not good until there's a labor shortage that drives wages up to make up for the 20 years of stagnant wages that we've had over the last uh, two decades. So I hope you would aspire for more than just a 4% unemployment rate. Uh, I do have a question for you here, and that is in your statement, you comment on the federal debt. You say the federal government debt is on an unsustainable path. Of course, fiscal policy is outside your purview, but it affects what you do. We also have a trade deficit, about a half a trillion dollars a year, all kind of uh, similar in size to the budget deficit. Um, and so every year we borrow another half trillion dollars to finance that as a country borrowing from abroad. I wonder if you could say that the U.S. trade deficit of over half a trillion dollars a year is on an uns unsustainable path. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't think I would say that. I mean, the, tra the, the, the current account deficit is really set by the difference between savings and investment. And I mean, the reason, that the reason the federal budget is on an unsustainable path is that the debt as a percentage of GDP is at a high level, but much more important than that, it's growing faster than GDP. So debt cannot grow faster than GDP mm -hmm. forever, whereas I, I don't know that I'd say that about the, uh, the Well, the, 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 the accumulated trade deficit where every year we borrow over a trillion, you know, over half a trillion dollars, just adds to our, our foreign debt. Um, but I want to go on. Uh, you know, some of my colleagues find this hearing kind of dry, and so they've urged me to spice things up by asking an accounting principles question. <laughs> um, we have uh, Cecil, the uh, proposal for the current expected credit loss uh, system being proposed by FASB. Uh, the effect, this is not the, the effect of this may be to increase reserves, but you and the other bank regulators are supposed to determine the size of reserves. We shouldn't increase or decrease reserves because of a esoteric accounting theory discussion which has gone awry. And so I wonder whether you believe that we should make this major accounting change for banks that will deter lending, particularly in economic downturns, uh, without a quantitative uh, impact study. Have you had a chance to look at uh, uh, this issue and how it will affect the banks that you regulate? Yeah, so we, we don't think that it will have that effect, but we'll be watching carefully. We, you know, we've, we've been looking at this, it's really been dis under discussion for a decade now. It's, it's a decision that FASB made and that we're just implementing. And if, if we find that it does have, that, have effects like that, then we'll, we'll take appropriate action. Thank you. Thank you very much. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, the gentleman, Mr. Posey from Florida, is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair and Ranking Member, for holding this hearing. And uh, Chairman Powell, thank you for being here to uh, present your semiannual report. Uh, I would like to think that everyone in this room, uh, at one level or, or another, is enjoying the success uh, that we're seeing continue in this country right now, and I want to thank you for the contributions that you have made to that. Uh, it's also great to have a chairman here who answers questions so directly, and we appreciate that. Uh, I saw recently some trends in banking uh, indicating that um, since 2008, we've seen a decline in the number of FDIC-insured banks of about 38 uh, percent, from 7,870 banks to 4,909 banks on the spreadsheet that I saw. Over the same period of time, uh, assets uh, grew by 80 percent from $10 trillion to $18 trillion. <clears throat> Merger have been going on at a very brisk pace, as you're no doubt aware, and I'd, I'd like you to uh, share what your research shows about the economic implications of increasing concentration in the banking industry and how that might restrict or perhaps enhance the availability of credit 
to those who take the risk on investments to grow our economy. Thank you. Um, consult the number of banks has been decreasing pretty steadily now for more than 30 years. I remember 14,000 was the number, I think, when I was in the government 25, more, uh, 30 years ago. Um, and it's a, it's a range of factors. It's, uh, it's people leaving rural areas. It's also allowing interstate banking and things like that. But for whatever reason, you've seen um, a long-run process. Now, we know that when a, when a small <laughs> bank goes out of business in a rural county or a small town, that's not a good thing. And that, that has, that's bad for the, for the country. It's bad for that town, bad for the social fabric. So we try not to add to the problems of community banks through excessive regulatory burden. We try to be mindful of their important role in society. Um, I, actually, the, the number of mergers last year, 2018, was the lowest in, in quite a long time. I asked, them, I asked the staff to go back and look. It's the lowest in at least 15 years. <clears throat> so mergers and consolidation are actually at a pretty low level. Um, I mean, the last thing I'll say is I think we need banks of all different sizes. In it. We, we need small banks. We need bank, banks across the spectrum in different business models serving different communities. You know, we want a diverse a diverse ecosystem of banks out there to have a, to have a healthy economy. Uh, you know, related to that same question, could you share the criteria that the Fed uses in evaluating bank <clears throat> merger applications? I'd be glad to. So it's, a, it qu it's quite detailed. There's, a, there's a, a Federal Reserve Act section that lays out a, a lot of detail, uh, and there's also plenty of guidance uh, um, uh, on, on that issue. Actually, I have a picture of it here. So um, we look at competitive factors, banking community factors, um, uh, managerial resources. Uh, we, we look at uh, compliance with consumer and fair lending laws and CRA record and that kind of thing. We look at um, the combined financials, of course, of the two companies. We also invite public comment. We have, a, we have a pretty thoroughly, carefully worked out process. We go through this process carefully for, for mergers. and. Um, Look at all those factors and then make a decision. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I wasn't uh, going to dwell in this realm un until we had a series of slides up here overhead and somebody else mentioned Fannie and Freddie. And, and so I'm curious if you could give us an update on the amount of tax dollars uh, that have been spent to date on defending the crooks uh, that um, mismanaged Fannie and Freddie and doggone near uh, bankrupted the whole operation. The last time we got a report, I'm thinking it was like about eight years ago, we'd already spent like over 600, millions, 600 million of taxpayer dollars defending these guys uh, from stockholder suits. Can you give us an update on that? I, I don't actually have an update on that for you. I can check into that though. I, okay, if you'd, if you'd communicate that to us, I would appreciate it very much. And I yield back to balance my time, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Meeks, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to bring it up. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Let me, you know, let me ask you a question. I, uh, there was a study that was done by the New York Fed that found that Americans are borrowing more for cars while borrowing less for houses. Uh, and the reason why the statistic caught my eye is because of my strong belief in home ownership and, and that is the best value for low and moderate income households to build wealth over a long period of time. And I often have said I would, would have, want individuals to rent the car and own the home as opposed to owning the car and renting the home. Um, and in a separate report, the Federal Reserve described the link between rising student debt and an acute decline in home ownership, particularly among young Americans. So my question is, what does declining home ownership rates, especially among young people saddled with student debt, uh, say about the overall health of the United States economy? Um, so the, I think the, the, how, the overall household picture of debt, if I can start with that, is basically a healthy one. There, there are a couple of areas of concern, and you touched on, on the main one, which I think is student debt. And um, there's a growing body of research that shows that students who, who borrow for their education and, and wind up not getting the kind of value they, they thought they would get so that their incomes are lower than they expected, can't pay the debt back. That debt can hang over their economic and personal lives for many years, meaning lower levels of home ownership and, and other, you know, other sort of measures of economic success. So we're seeing, we're seeing more and more evidence of that as so, student and, debt grows. 
Oh, and, and just a, and on, a, on, a, on a, I guess, a different column in the same way, um, you, you've identified that debt is also high uh, among low-rated or unrated non-financial firms, and that underwriting has deteriorated in lending to highly indebted businesses. So I'm switching from the individual yeah. to the business. Now, this leverage lending. Uh, and obviously we want to encourage prudent lending to American businesses, even those with existing debt, but I don't want to go back to 2008. So does the Fed believe that increased credit risk in the leveraged loan market pose systemic vulnerabilities, uh, particularly in the event of an economic downturn? Uh, so this is a, an important supervisory focus, and um, we, the, the headline answer to your question is we don't believe it poses systemic um, kinds of risks, but we do think it proposes a, you know, a, a macroeconomic risk, particularly in the event of an economic downturn. These are, these are companies that have borrowed in good times and borrowed you know, high amounts of debt, and if there is a downturn, they'll be less able to carry out their roles in the economy. And uh, you know, that, that, that may have an amplification effect on a downturn. Our supervision of banks indicates that the banks do not have excessively high exposures to these highly levered non-financial corporations and also don't have uh, excessively large pipelines of commitments that they've made. Those are two things that they did have before the financial crisis that they don't have now. So the, the actual, the banks, and that's our, our window into this, is largely through bank supervision. The banks have really changed the way they manage their involvement in this business in a way that that puts the risk out, in, out in, uh, in the holder's hands rather than the bank's hands. So we tried to, and we came up with Dodd-Frank uh, to deal with the mortgage crises back in 2008, uh, and we tried to make sure that we're now watching with reference to living wills and other things to prevent. Uh, do you think we are prepared and we have enough uh, regulators are watching uh, closely enough so that we can avoid leverage lending ending up being the next bubble that burst? and it causes us to have the same kind of financial crises that we had in 2008? Yes, I, I, so I think our financial system is so much better capitalized and has so much more liquidity. It has a better sense of its risks and a better ability to manage those risks. Stress tests require banks to take a forward-looking, particularly the largest banks, a forward-looking assessment of their capital adequacy. They've also done resolution planning. So the, the, our banking system is so much more resilient and so much stronger than it was before the financial crisis, so that it should be able to withstand the kinds of shocks that, that we're talking about. So if there were, for example, uh, unexpectedly high credit losses among non-financial corporates, then yes, the banks should have plenty of capital and liquidity to absorb those losses. It doesn't mean there wouldn't be you know, disruptions and losses, it, 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 because there would be in the economy, but, but it would not be, we don't think, uh, the kind of thing that we saw in 2008. So by and large, Dodd-Frank did a lot to help us, and there may be other avenues that I think that we may need to include therein to just continue to protect ourselves. I think Dodd-Frank and the, broad, the whole broader regulatory program, which went way beyond Dodd-Frank, uh, did serve, serve its purpose in strengthening our financial system, yes. The gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Lukemeyer, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Chairman Powell, welcome. Good to see you again. Uh, before I get into my questions, I'd like to bring up one issue related to guidance. I've consistently fought to ensure that the difference between guidance and rule is clear. You and I have had a number of conversations on this, in fact, in this committee before. Uh, however, just last week I saw a letter from Senators Tillis and Crapo to the Comptroller General regarding LISIC. From reading this letter, it appears the Fed throughout the Obama administration created a regulatory and advisory regime that forced banks to meet numerous requirements re related to liquidity and capital without going through the rulemaking process. If this is true, the Fed, the Fed has to take a second look at the guidance issued in relation to LISIG and ensure that the proper rulemaking process is followed. I just want to give you a heads up. I'm going to be watching this issue very carefully and appreciate your attention to this matter. Uh, with regards to uh, my good colleague from, from, from Oklahoma, Mr. Lucas, uh, I just want to add my uh, thoughts to his with regards to interaffiliate margin. This is also an issue I want to watch very carefully. And uh, I want to watch your actions. I think it's important that we take action on this issue. So I'm looking forward to working with you on that as well. <clears throat> issue that is most concerned to me this morning 
<clears throat> is uh, Cecil. I mean, we talked about this a number of times already this morning with uh, a number of my colleagues. Uh, there seems to be a growing concern from more and more, not only bankers, but consumers, uh, whether it's the realtors, the mortgage bankers, the chamber, the home builders, uh, as they, they begin to understand the costs that are associated with this. I know you indicated a minute ago that you didn't think it's going to have much effect, but, um, you know, my colleague across the aisle a minute ago said that she's not concerned about how it's going to affect banks, so I'm desperately and very, very concerned about how it's going to affect banks because how it affects banks is going to affect consumers. If banks have to raise their cost of being able to make a loan, that's going to cause people no longer have the ability to have home loans. We had in this committee back in December, the home builders testified that for every $1,000 worth of increased cost, it cost 100,000 people, 100,000 people across this country the opportunity to have a home loan. And of course, those are going to be the low to moderate income folks. Uh, this is very concerning to me. And when you look at the banks having to either pass that cost along or have to eat it and therefore ensure that they, they spread the costs out against uh, other costs, that they, uh, other incomes they have, or they just curtail their lending activities altogether, which in some cases has happened. In my district, I've got banks that no longer make home loans because of the increased cost. So I guess my question to you uh, this morning, Chairman, is, um, you know, this, is, this to me is going to have a devastating effect on the home lending market, especially when you start to talk about the GSEs. And when we start having a, a dramatic effect on the GSEs, who no longer have, if we lose 100,000 homeowners, that's gonna affect the economy. You always talk about the building that's not gonna go on, about all the sales of, of materials not gonna, that's not gonna go on. This is gonna have a devastating effect on our economy, which is directly in your purview. So, in conversations with Chairman uh, Otting, who now oversees Freddie and Fannie, he gave me some figures, which I'm trying to get him to verify in a written letter request, that are, that are going to be out of this world, of how he's going to have to reserve for this and have to pass those costs along. So can you tell me, from just this conversation I'm, uh, I'm, I'm having here with you, um, what your thoughts would be along those lines? Would you have concerns about the GSEs uh, having to pass those costs along and the inability of consumers to have access to uh, credit as a result of that? And uh, sorry, you, were you tying that back to Cecil? Uh, yes, yes. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Well, yes. I mean, I think we know uh, that regulation does have a cost, and uh, we try to. That's why we try to make it as efficient as we can, and and, and no more burdensome than, than it needs to be. Again, I think on on Cecil, we have tried. To, we've put a lot of resources in in um, trying to understand how it will affect uh, behavior of banks, and we're going to be watching that very carefully. We've also, again, we've. For, for our banks, we've, we've allowed a three-year phase in that, that doesn't even start until next year, so we're going to be seeing it coming in gradually, and we're going to be watching very carefully to see whether these effects happen. Well, I know in talking with banks from Wall Street to Main Street, especially small guys, nobody likes this rule. Yeah. And it's going to be, and the, the original, uh, to me, what was told by FASB is the original, original reason for it was to have better transparency, understanding risk on the balance sheet with regards to home loans. But if you're an investor investing in a, a limitedly held bank or a credit union or a, 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 you know, a, a single individual owning a bank, there is no need for this sort of uh, risk ex, uh, ex exposure, and therefore it's unnecessary. So it's, I, I'm very concerned about this. And as I said, this is, there's a growing groundswell of concern out there, and I hope that you take this in consideration. I yield back. The gentleman from uh, Texas, Mr. Green, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I thank the chair for being here with us today. I'm honored to be in your company again. Um, I have uh, great respect for your intellectual prowess. And I say this because you have had to deal with a level of inanity that most Fed chairs don't have to deal with. I'd like for you to hear now the words of the President of the United States. He indicated, I'm doing deals and I'm not being accommodated by the Fed. That would be you. I'm not happy with the Fed. They're making mistakes because I have a gut and my gut tells me more sometimes than anybody's brain can ever tell me. 
you have access to some of the greatest minds in the world. You do research. I assume that when you're setting the federal funds rate, that you rely on that research and not on the president's gut. Uh, I assume that you do this because you understand the impact that it can have on the economy. And I'd just like, for the record, just for the record, would you indicate that you do have the level of research necessary to make these decisions without the benefit of the president's gut? We, we, I think we have uh, quite adequate resources at the Fed. We have terrific people, and we have a very strong culture, more than anything, which is a, a culture of commitment to making these decisions for the benefit of all Americans based on our best thinking, diverse perspectives, and without considering political factors. That's our culture, and it's a strong one. Thank you. And you do quite a bit of research in various and sundry areas. Uh, you've done research in terms of uh, African-American unemployment, unemployment of teenagers. Is that a fair statement? Oh, yes, quite a bit. I would like um, to ask you, if I may, if the stock market is a fair asset test for the health of the economy. Should we rely solely on the stock market? It seems that the president does. We, we, of course, look at a wide range of financial conditions, credit market conditions. The stock market is one of, one of many factors. One of many, but not the no, sole it's factor. Not the, one of many. not the one that um, supersedes others. No, it's one of many. One of many. Why is it so important for the Fed to be independent? Um, I think it's important because uh, you've given us an important job, which is um, to achieve maximum employment and stable prices. Uh, and um, we need to do that in a way that is strictly non-political. You've given us long terms. You've given us protection from um, sort of shorter term political considerations. And you've kind of ordered us to do our business that way. And um, you know the record is that central banks that are independent, that have a degree of independence from, um, from the rest of the government, do a better job at, at serving the general public. Would it also have a little bit to do with uh, the fact that you want people to rely on what you do, and you want people to assume that what you do is not predicated upon the whims of some political personality? It, it's very important that, that the public understand that we who we are and how we do our business, which is, which is strictly non-political and based on the best thinking we can, uh, we can muster. We have, we now, have. let me get to the question that I really wanted to ask, and it's this. Invidious discrimination. You've done many studies. You've acknowledged it. You've acknowledged that you have some of the best minds in the world. I want you, Mr. Powell, to do a study to determine the impact that invidious discrimination, that would be racism, that would be sexism, that would be homophobia, that would be xenophobia, that would be nativism, that would be anti-Semitism, the impact that invidious discrimination has on the economy. The impact that invidious discrimination has on the economy. This is a question that will help us to better assure that you can meet the mandates that have been accorded you. It is unfortunate that we try our best to change the circumstance, but we've been doing it without the benefit of this intelligence. How soon do you think you can help me with this intelligence, please? Well, uh, I will speak to some of my research colleagues and come back to you. Um, I'll, I'll look back to you quickly. But I will look forward to hearing from you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. The gentleman uh, from Michigan, Mr. Heisinger, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, uh, Dr. Powell, good seeing you, or Chair Powell, it's good seeing you here today. I've, I've got four areas I want to quickly go over. Volcker Rule, uh, options, specifically exchange-listed options. Uh, I'd like to hit uh, Fed inflation target increase discussion, if, if at all possible, and then the workforce participation that you had uh, brought up in your uh, opening statement. Uh, first, on the Volcker Rule, um, as ranking member of the Capital Markets uh, uh, Subcommittee, 
uh, been very concerned about the Volcker rule and, and how the rule has been uh, detrimental to U.S. capital markets. And last October, uh, myself, uh, uh, Chairman Lukemeyer, and Chairman Hensreling at the time sent you a letter dated October 16. Uh, I don't believe we've actually received a response as of yet, uh, but uh, in this, uh, it was concerning. We raised concerns that the Volcker rule unnecessarily restricts a bank's ability to make long-term investments on, in small businesses as a result of the covered funds provisions. And uh, as you know, the, such funds provide the same type of financing that a bank is authorized to do on its own balance sheet, but Volcker rule uh, prohibits a bank from performing this activity through fund structures. Uh, previously, you've recognized that a bank's long-term investments uh, in covered funds generally do not threaten safety and soundness and, and, and said regulars uh, would look for ways to encourage this important activity uh, within the language and intent of the statute. Now, the <clears throat> letter was addressed to uh, Secretary Mnuchin, uh, yourself, uh, Chair Clayton, uh, uh, Comptroller Odding, uh, Chair McWilliams, and Chair uh, Giancarlo uh, at the time. I, that has been referred to at various times as the five-headed hydra. Uh, but I'm wondering when, uh, when you are uh, planning to address this issue. So I, you know, I think we received <clears throat> quite extensive comments on that proposal, and um, you mentioned the, the covered funds part of it. We, uh, you know, and I'll just say we're looking carefully at, at ways to address some of the concerns that were raised on that, and also on the accounting. Part. Uh, how quickly can we expect clarity? Um, I don't. I don't have a date for you, but I, I can get you. A, I can get you a better sense of that quickly and come back to your office. That would be. Uh, that would be helpful. Uh, and last May, the Federal Reserve issued a proposal that would focus compliance and application of the Volcker Rule on the size of a banking firm's market trading business, rather on rather than on the size of the uh, of the bank's assets. Uh, two are not always the same, as we, as we know. And when do you envision finalizing that proposed tailoring rule? Ah. Uh. The, uh, this is the, this is the 2155. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, that one we so again we've got comments. We have I think we have a dozen rules out for comment and back. Well, that was last May that the that the uh, you issued a proposal. So this, if you're talking about the the overall tailoring proposal, are you talking about this isn't the Volcker rule? This is the Volcker part of the. Uh, correct. It, it's uh, it's dealing with the size of the firm's trading business rather than the size of its assets. Yeah, I, I'll come back to you with the time. Okay, I'd that. appreciate that. Um, uh, options, uh, as you know, for centrally cleared exchange-listed options market, the current exposure method has negatively impacted liquidity and has increased cost to customers. Uh, last uh, Congress, the Options Market Stability Act received unanimous support, and I know America b has, doesn't believe us when we actually say we can agree on something on occasion. Uh, but uh, we, I believe it would help solve some of these issues. Uh, thankfully, the Federal Reserve, along with the OCC and the FDIC, issued a proposal in October of last year to replace the current exposure method proposed for purposes of exchange-listed options uh, with a more risk-sensitive methodology be applied, known as the standardized approach for calculating counterparty risk. Uh, can you indicate uh, when the banking agencies intend to finalize this rulemaking? You know, and I know what's another one we have comments on. I think that's coming soon. Uh, again, I'll come back to you with a particular date. All right. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, it sounds like we're going to have a long meeting after this one. <laughs> after this one. Uh, the, uh, in my remaining minute here, the Fed inflation target increase. <clears throat> by the way, I, the dual mandate has been brought up. Uh, and to, uh, to quote it specifically, uh, what, uh, and I've never quite understood why it's called a dual mandate when it says, quote, from 1977, the Federal Reserve, uh, the con Congress mandated that uh, Fed, quote, promote effectively the goals of maximum employment, stable prices, and moderate long-term interest rates. We somehow forget that third part all the time uh, when we have this discussion. But last week, news reports <clears throat> indicated that the Fed may be considering a higher inflation target rather than the 2% uh, that, uh, that has been adopted, not mandated, but adopted. And I'm concerned that the Fed, frankly, is going to be rushing into some new approaches when we're not necessarily understanding what we're living with right now. And I'm wondering <clears throat> if you could comment on that. We are not looking at a higher inflation target, full stop. Okay, what excellent. We're, what we're looking at is, is a, a way to more credibly achieve our existing symmetric 2%, 2 inflation okay. target. Great. And then in the remaining seconds, uh, why is the labor participation rate for, quote, prime age workers, uh, as you had said in your opening statement, falling? Uh, we're seeing older workers, those labor rate uh, increasing, but uh, seeing prime age. It is a, uh, that is a longer conversation and a really important one. And I think it, it, it's, a, it's a range of things. It's, um, it's people who, it's largely in younger workers. It has to do with, uh, with uh, 
globalization. It's got to do with technology. It's got to do with the opioid crisis. It's got to do with the, um, the flattening out of U.S. educational attainment over the years. So that's, this is an incredibly important issue, and I'd love to talk more about it. But I look forward to our next meeting. Thanks. The gentleman from, uh, Miz uh, from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Chairman, I think at, at, at this very moment, I, I, the uh, U.S. Trade Representative is testifying before the Ways and Means Committee, and one of the issues they are gonna, going to raise is uh, U.S.-China uh, uh, trade issues. Um, and according to the U.S. Trade Representative, in uh, 2016, uh, about 85,000 workers in Missouri uh, are employed because of uh, our uh, trade that uh, is, is very, that trade is very critical because of, of their unemployment, or their employment. And then in 2017, uh, they, uh, the trade representative reported uh, that uh, about $14 billion a year uh, in uh, agricultural exports uh, actually promote the employment situation in Missouri, 85,000 uh, jobs. Uh, I don't want you to get into um, policy, but um, how do you weigh uh, the uh, uncertainty uh, in trade uh, with um, the, the Fed actually trying to uh, create healthy uh, monetary policy. Um, so as you, as you know, we, uh, we have this thing called the Beige Book where we, we accumulate the comments of our vast array of uh, economic and other contacts around the country, and really for the last year or so, a, a principal feature of those comments has been uncertainty around trade. We have companies say that they're concerned about higher prices, about, um, you know, because they're importing materials as part of their product, and some of them saying that they're delaying um, investments of various kinds and hiring of various kinds. We, we have we can't really see through to what the effect of this. Probably at the aggregate level, it's not big. Individual companies, of course, can be very, very much affected. So there's, there's a lot of uncertainty out there, and it would be good to have uh, uh, trade issues resolved. That said, of course, we don't have a role in trade. We right. don't advise the administration, and we don't comment on particular policies, as you indicated. Yeah, absolutely. I, um, $14 billion uh, that, that uh, comes into our state to support these jobs. Uh, much of that comes from my congressional district. Uh, Saline County, for example, um, is one of the top spots in the nation for the export of, of beans uh, to China. Um, and uh, the, the farmers are, just to uh, ac uh, accent what you just said, the farmers, some of them are even saying, maybe we should just leave our beans in the ground. I mean, why, why go, uh, go through the whole process? And even though they've been getting some kind of a little compensation from the federal government, uh, you know, they are saying, we want trade, not aid. Um, and so uh, there is a, a serious issue. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the, the U.S. deficit and in, in, uh, in physical concerns uh, uh, as it relates to the tax bill is something that you, you've heard us uh, speak about. And, and again, I'm going to try to ask a question so that it doesn't require you to get into policy. Uh, uh, but uh, it, it's interesting, it would be interesting to know what the economic impact of the tax, pa pa tax package uh, has been uh, and may uh, continue to impact our economy. Um, it, is there any data available uh, that would give us an idea about that uh, impact of the tax package? You know, uh, I think CBO would be the best source of, of to, to sort of score what's happening to the economy from a very, from a particular law. We look at the aggregate economy and, and, you know, the effects of the tax package are mixed in with everything else that's happening from our standpoint. Okay, so the Fed doesn't, wouldn't speak to that. 
We, we had estimates, but with a $20 trillion economy, we don't, we don't spend a lot of time trying to look back and, and you know, that's really not what we do. We, we, we made estimates at the beginning, and I think we've adjusted them um, along the way. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Duffy, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, welcome. Mr. Chairman, good to see you. Uh, just a quick question on insurance before we go to other topics. Um, uh, I, I think you've indicated that the U.S. insurance regulatory model is uh, provided for strong solvency. Our insurance companies are well capitalized. Uh, but now uh, the IAIS mm -hmm. is developing a new international capital regime. I think uh, your colleague, Mr. Quarles, indicated that it would be a challenge for us to implement um, that new regime in the U.S. And so my question for you, um, as, as you're part of these negotiations, is the U.S. going to agree to a new insurance capital um, set of regulations, or are we going to uh, provide some pushback and try to get formal recognition of our U.S.-based uh, model? So my, my understanding is that we are <clears throat> we're working with that group internationally to make sure that whatever they do adopt in the end works for our system, which we think is a good system. So we're, we're of course, not going to um, implement something that doesn't work for us. Uh, and we're, you know, we're working with that international group to make sure that what is ultimately adopted does work for us. Okay, fair enough. Um, did, in, in 2018, you said the, uh, the U.S. GDP growth was what? It looks like it's just a tiny bit under two, under three percent. It might turn out being three percent. It might be two nine. And pretty uh, good. When was the last time we hit three percent growth for a year? Two thousand and six, I believe. Two thousand and six. So it's been over ten years. Twelve years. And I think some other uh, people had indicated that uh, the U.S. economy could never hit three percent again. What happened? Why are we hitting 3%? I mean, we're, we're pretty long into this recovery, right? I mean, this is one of the longest expansions that we've had since the Great Depression. Fair enough? It's one of the longest in U.S. history. Yeah, and um, so at the end of the expansion, you should see this petering out, but you didn't. You've actually seen some of the highest growth in the whole expansion over, you know, in over you know, 12 years. What happened? Well, it was a good year. There are a lot of things that happened. Oh, I know it was a good year. What happened? Well, a lot of things did, and um, I, I, I think that the, uh, you know, the tax cuts and spending increases, the fiscal package, certainly supported demand in a meaningful way. And so lower taxes actually contributed to growth? Yes, they supported demand. I mean, the, I think the real yeah. hope, though, would be that there would be supply-side effects over time, and that, that's, that's something we hope, we hope will be uh, big, but it, that, that takes longer. It takes more time to, to work its way through the system. And so... so uh, Tax cuts have contributed to 3% growth. Has any kind of regulatory reform from the, from the administration helped with that growth as well? You know, it's really hard to isolate that. That's a, that's a question that, uh, that people really struggle with. I, I, the way I think about it is we, we, really, we don't want regulation to be any more uh, costly or burdensome than it needs to be it to get to this be. job done. And so 3% growth. Um, and did you, did you make some commentary upon, uh, about the unemployment rates of whites, Latinos, and, and African Americans? I did. What, are, are they, is, uh, is unemployment higher today, or is it lower for those individuals? Uh, I think we're for, for um, blacks and, and uh, Latinos and Latinas. Uh, we are at historic lows since the data. The data haven't been kept more than about the last 40, 50 years. You're near historic lows there. So more people are working. And all, if we want to look at all of the races, there, everyone's working more, right? Yes. The, the labor market is very healthy. Very healthy. And their wages, did you testify, was what? Their wages are going down or their wages are going up? Um, wages have been moving up um, up nicely in the last uh, in the They're last year. They're making more money, so. right? Particularly for people at the lower end of the uh, labor force. Yeah. So so more people are working, more people are making more money, and more people. I think you indicated uh, with the uh, lower uh, education or lower skill sets are making more money. Is that correct? Yes, that is right. Yeah. And so I find it fascinating that some of my colleagues across the aisle bash the tax cuts. They bash the president. Um, and the economic policies that have come from this administration and a Republican Congress. But the net end result has been that more people work, more people make more money, the economy grows at 3%, and when all those great things are happening, 
for all of these Americans, no matter whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, whether you're African American, you're white, you're Hispanic, you're Latino, everybody's doing better under this, um, the, the, these policies. But all the same, my friends across the aisle try to tap me down as they also bash the president on policies that have, hel that have helped every single American. I think that's shameful. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Foster, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and let's see, I, uh, along the same vein, I, I think it's, if you look at figure one in your, in the report that you gave us, um, you look at the rate of job creation, and I think it's remarkable how constant it has been with no visible uh, change as a result of any of the policies of the last two years. And I think that's the, the relevant observation there. Um, now, uh, this Saturday, March 2nd, uh, the uh, currently suspended debt limit, debt ceiling on the debt limit is going to come back into effect. Um, unless we uh, pass legislation or do something about it. Now, that's, um, there's, we have some runway on uh, various extraordinary measures that can be done by the <clears throat> Treasury and others. Um, do you have a, a feeling, first off, on how much runway we have before Congress has to deal with the debt limit? And, and can you say a little bit about what the implications of defaulting on that would be? I think that uh, there's real uncertainty about when the actual date that the government will run out of cash and not be able to pay all bills when they are due will come, but it will be later this year. It could be late in the summer. It could be in the fall. I think uh, it remains to be seen uh, at this point. And, I, you know, I think the main thing is we've never failed to pay all of our bills when, it, when and as due, and I think that, that, that can never happen. That's not just not, not something we can allow to happen. I think our credit rating and our credit as a country is such an important asset um, that we need to stop short of letting that happen. I think it could have very hard to predict, but possibly quite bad consequences if we were to default on our payments. Now, in the past, when we've come close to defaulting, uh, sort of walked up to the, the cliff on that. Um, you know, what have been the effects uh, to markets? Um, you know, credit ratings, the whole. You know, what were the implications for the general economy? Any way to quantify that? Very, very hard to quantify it. I know uh, in 2011 that we were downgraded as a consequence of this, and um, I know that there were financing costs went up for a period right at the height of the crisis, and there was a, that, that significant cost imposed on the taxpayer for that. Mm -hmm. Now, a, a few days ago, the president proudly announced that he was, he'd reached a currency manipulation deal with China, which I understand <clears throat> you indicated you uh, consult with uh, the administration on this. Um, have you been told what that deal is? Has the Federal Reserve been informed? I think our, our staff is basically, the, the, our, our point is, we, we don't handle uh, currency. That's really the Treasury's job. The, the thing that is our concern is that we be allowed to conduct monetary policy with a free hand. Yeah, but, uh, but have you been informed of what that deal is? I, at the staff level, we, I think people are in contact and made sure that that limited interest has been addressed. Was, was that a, a yes or no or? Yes. So you, you have been informed. So people in the Fed know what that deal is, although I understand as, you may as not As it relates to our interest, I believe so, yes. Okay. Um, are there other tail risks that you think we should be worrying about, you know, things like hard Brexit? Um, what, what are your top few um, sources of tra tail risk that you think we should be thinking about in Congress? Yeah, I th so I, th I think the, the outlook for the U.S. economy is, is a positive one, and I think that uh, I would start with, you know, slowing global growth. We've seen global growth, particularly in China and Europe, through the course of 2018 and right into 2019. Um, growth in 2017 was a real uh, tailwind. Um, for the United States economy. It was synchronized global growth around the world. As the global economy slows outside the United States, it becomes a headwind, so we're feeling that. Um, I, Brexit is, uh, uh, is it just an event, and it may, it may pass without much implications for the United States, but it's unprecedented, and so it's, it's hard to say exactly what the implications. Of course, we're monitoring it very carefully. Mm -hmm. Now, late last year, the uh, comment period closed on uh, considerations that you had for uh, developing a real-time interbank settlement system. Uh, and can you say a little bit about, uh, just give us an update on what your current thoughts on that, the schedule we might be looking at? 
Yes, yeah, so we're, we put this proposal out for comment. We've gotten a lot of comments. We're reviewing them. And, you know, the idea is that uh, cent central banks can really provide immediate final settlement in yep. re real time payments and really, really and some do internationally many do internationally and the question is should we should we take this on and i think there um, you know it's a it's a question we have to evaluate under our existing statute and we'll take our time in doing that we have to conclude that it that it's economically viable that we can charge for it in other words and also that it's something that the private sector can't adequately handle and um, you know so we're going to we're going to look at that we think it could Clearly, it could um, um, support real-time payments, which we think would be a positive thing. On the other hand, it has to work under our statute. Thank you. Thank you. Yield back. <clears throat> Gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Stivers, is uh, rec recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Chairman Powell, thank you for being here. I want to uh, follow up on some questions that uh, the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Duffy, was talking to you about. Uh, obviously, 3% economic growth, 4% unemployment, real wage growth is growing. It was a pretty good year for the American people and the American worker, correct? Yes, it was a good year. Uh, one of the things that you talked about with Mr. Duffy as a result of the tax cuts one of the things that we'd all like to see is some supply side growth over time. Uh, can you help us understand what that would mean? It would mean capital investment, which would grow productivity and then make the economy grow even faster, correct? Yes, I think a couple of things. For, the first would be the one you mentioned, which is um, if you give more favorable treatment to capital expenditures in the tax code, over time you ought to see more capital expenditures. Capital, capital expenditures drive productivity and um, Productivity is what drives the rising living standards. So, um, but I think with supply side uh, initiatives, you, it, it, it takes time. It has to work its way into the thinking of businesses and into the capital stock. And I just think we, we hope those effects are large, but um, we'll have to be patient to see them come in. There's also a, a smaller possible effect in lower tax rates on individuals, which could call forth more labor supply. So we don't, these are highly uncertain supply side effects and they'll take longer to emerge, but we hope. And can I ask you about the beginning parts of what we're seeing on that? We've seen new people enter the labor market in the last six months that had given up on working or staying in the market that, that we're starting to leave. Isn't that correct? Yes, the, the test of, so what we don't know is how much of that is cyclical. In other right. words, because the labor market is so tight right now. Right, and the second question, we've seen capital expenditures go up uh, in the last six months, but we've not seen those pay off yet. Well, we saw, so cap, cap, capital expenditures were very strong in the early part of 18. They petered out a little bit, and it may be because of... But in the total know, year, they were up, correct? Yes, and we, we expect them to continue to be at a healthy level. Great, and, and so hopefully what we've done on tax cuts will continue to pay dividends into the future, but I wanted people to understand how that works. Uh, second, uh, quickly on monetary policy, uh, it seems that uh, there's been a change in the way that monetary policy has worked. Uh, the federal funds markets for non-GSEs is at a 40-year low of volume. And so it seems that the interest on excess reserves is getting to be a more important part of what you do. Uh, can you talk about that shift since 2008? Yes. So um, pre-crisis, uh, there was a small, a small amount of reserves, and we could manage the federal funds rate by making relatively small adjustments in the quantity of reserves. In the, in the current era, where the demand for reserves is so high, and frankly a little bit volatile too, have, trying to do that, trying to manage scarcity in that kind of a very large pool, we'd have to have a very large presence in the markets on an ongoing basis. We don't think that's a good, that's not something we, so we, we think that we've decided to continue to use our existing framework, which is to use our administrator's rates. So, administrator. so the interest on excess reserves is, is, is very fundamental for the way we manage our policy now. Thank you. And it uh, seems to work very well. Great. And two more quick questions. One is, hopefully you can answer quickly, but uh, there is a new sort of focus on modern monetary theory that says taxes can better fight inflation than monetary policy. Do you have a basic philosophical view of that? So that aspect of it would be a complete change. And I, mean, the, I would say the reason why the Fed does that is that we can move quickly with our tools. And to, to, to give the legislature that responsibility, in principle, you could do that. But 
we have a system that's got lots of checks and balances. And so let's assume for a second those two tools work equally. Who can move faster, the Federal Reserve or Congress? We can move immediately. Yeah. Much faster. Yes. Thank you. And that's assuming they are equally effective, which I would argue that uh, monetary policy is far <clears throat> superior as well. Real quickly, uh, one last thing on real-time payments. Uh, something you said that I hope you'll uh, stay focused on is whether the, the free market and the private sector can actually provide a real-time payment system, because if they can, there's no need for the Federal Reserve to do it. That's part of the, um, part of the thing we have to look at under the Monetary Control Act. Thank you. Thank you. I yield back the balance of my time, Madam Chair. Thank you. The uh, gentleman from Washington, Mr. Heck. Thank you, Madam Chair. He's recognized Chair. for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I <clears throat> always ask the same question to the Chair of the Federal Reserve Board, which is, when does America get a raise? I may have to revise that slightly because obviously we're beginning to see some evidence of that, uh, which I think is an indication of the, the full employment objective mandate that you have. So good job. In fact, I commend you for your uh, hitting the patience button uh, of late. But I, I'm looking at these payroll gains of, I think you indicated an average of north of 200,000 jobs added every month. And I don't think that yet looks like full employment, month in and month out. Um, and as Minnesota uh, Fed President Kashkari has noted, the share of income going to labor, the share of income going to labor isn't really reversing its long-term slide. So when the FOMC is being patient and watching the data, what are you looking for in the labor market? How much slack do we have left? We look at a, at a very broad range of indicators. With inflation, we, we can look at one indicator, and we actually we think central banks control that. The labor market is different. So we look at the unemployment rate. We also look at labor force participation. We look at wages. We look at job openings. I could go on. There are 20 or 30. And how much slack do we have left? And so you, don't, you never know precisely, and you're, you're learning in real time. And I, I, so I think we've learned from the performance of labor force participation over the last few years, and particularly the last year, that, uh, that there are more people out there who will come back into the labor force, and that creates more slack. So, More um, slack to come? We hope so. Uh, you know, so we, know, we don't really know. There, there is a long-run aging trend in our country which, by, by which you know, my generation is now retiring. And so you're going to have lower labor force participation compared to what you would have had. But, but the, you know, the very strong labor market seems to be pulling people in and holding people in from leaving. So it's a very, very positive development. We hope it continues. So once we get to full employment, the definition of which you will acknowledge has been a moving target on the part of the Fed, are you willing to let wage growth, wage growth climb to 4% either to begin to recover some of the decline that we've experienced uh, or labor share of income, uh, or alternatively, an idea that I don't think is discussed often enough, to see if tight labor markets themselves can improve or boost productivity. Are you letting to wet, wait, letting? Are you willing to let wage growth hit four percent? So we're we're really targeting price inflation, not wage inflation. And um, you know, so wages should they should equal to it in, in the aggregate. Okay. Uh, inflation plus productivity. As a follow-up, I have a couple of charts. Do we have them? Uh, these are your two mandates, obviously, full employment and price stability. You referenced the price stability. My second slide focuses just on it. So could we go to the second slide or not? The second slide. I'm burning daylight. You Evidently, we can't there. go to the second slide. Uh, this shows the record over the last 25 years with respect <clears throat> to the uh, Fed's price, price stability target of 2%. I think what's important to note is that we've underperformed 85 months versus overheating two months. Uh, 213 months within, within a half percent of target, and good on you for that as well. But clearly, the long-term record of the Fed has been to underperform. So there is a relationship between wage growth and price stability, 
and on the issue of price stability, the Fed has been underperforming way more, a multiple of I don't know how many, uh, than o overheating. And this speaks obviously to the issue of when are we going to get wage growth that begins to compensate for years and years of decline. I, I know you're engaged in a healthy exercise to review the tools and communications. Frankly, sir, what I would hope <clears throat> is that would be taken into account, uh, frankly, some, some more transparent advancing of the historic record um, as a means of informing policy going forward, because I think this data speaks very clearly that we have a need to place a greater emphasis on wage growth and the factors that it affect it. Thank you, Madam Chair. If I can just say, you, you're absolutely right about the inflation data, and I, I think a number of us have commented on that recently, so I, I like your charts. <laughs> Thank you. The gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Barr, is recognized for five minutes. Chairman Powell, welcome back to the committee, and uh, uh, I, uh, I will note that when you were uh, first confirmed, you did make a commitment to improve Fed communications, and I want to compliment you and thank you for um, uh, our conversations, and I think you have fulfilled, by and large, that commitment to improve uh, Fed communications, but I suppose it's my job uh, to hold the Fed accountable, and so I'm going to press you on a few issues here today, uh, first of which is uh, the Fed's uh, negative net worth. Uh, the former CEO of the Chicago uh, Federal Home Loan Bank, Alex Pollock, recently observed that the Federal Reserve is insolvent on a mark-to-market -market basis. Uh, you may have read his commentary on this. Uh, Pollock's analysis is that as of the end of September, the Federal Reserve had a $66 billion uh, in unrealized losses on its portfolio of long-term mortgage securities and bonds. This equates to a 170 percent of the Fed's capital and means that on a mark-to-market -market basis, the Fed had a net worth uh, of negative $27 billion. If interest rates continue to rise, the unrealized loss will keep getting bigger and the mark-to-market -market network will, net worth will keep getting more negative. Chairman Powell, does it matter that the Federal Reserve is insolvent? No, it doesn't matter at all for any purpose. Um, the um, uh, unrealized losses have no effect whatsoever on our ability to conduct monetary policy. You'll recall that we've been giving close to $100 billion every year in our profits back to the uh, back to the Treasury at the end of the year, or during the course of the year. So it really, it really, it, it, in no sense are we, are we functionally insolvent. D does the, does the uh, mark to market negative net worth make it more difficult to raise the federal funds rate? Absolutely not. Okay. Uh, n next question is um, the balance sheet, uh, uh, another discussion on the balance sheet and the, and the, and the uh, balance sheet reduction program. Um, in your testimony, you stated that the Fed had made, quote, substantial progress on reducing reserves and that the Fed is, quote, prepared to adjust the balance sheet normalization program. This does seem to be a shift uh, from your comments in December when you said you believe that the runoff of the balance sheet has been smooth and has served its purpose, and I don't see us changing that. I think I heard you explain that banks' demand for reserves have increased, uh, and I recognize that currency has doubled from about $850 billion to $1.7 trillion. But please explain what caused uh, the shift in the Fed, Fed's balance sheet reduction plan and give us a better understanding, if you can, of the final destination uh, between the $4 trillion um, size right now and the $1.7 trillion currency level. So um, at our November meeting, I should go back another meeting, um, we began a series of meetings to engage on just this set of issues. And uh, what, what's, what is balance sheet normalization going to look like? And, um, you know, I didn't want to get ahead of the committee in December. And, and also, I think the markets became much more sensitive to, this, to these issues. They had been pretty insensitive to them for some years. So the truth is, we've now had three consecutive meetings on, on the balance sheet, and we've We've worked out, I think, the, 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 the framework of a plan that we hope to be able to announce soon that will light the way all the way to the end of, um, of balance sheet normalization and that will result in the end of asset runoff sometime later this year. Well, thank you, and I, I thanks for that explanation. I, I would just urge uh, you and your colleagues to r remain mindful of the fact that there are critics out there that continue to express concern about the size and the composition of the balance sheet uh, as remaining 
fairly unconventional and, and the risk that that could pose. Final question is uh, related to a regulatory matter, the GSIB surcharge. Uh, in July, uh, I uh, sent a letter with uh, 28 of my colleagues to Vice Chair Quarles regarding the GSIB surcharge. Uh, we expressed our concern in that letter uh, that uh, that surcharge puts U.S. banks at a, a disadvantage when it comes to international competitiveness. This surcharge is more stringent than the one adopted by the International Basel Committee and was adopted before many of the measures to increase resiliency and resolvability were fully implemented. Uh, yesterday, before the Banking Committee, you stated that the financial system has much higher capital, uh, much higher liquidity, better risk management, and the stress tests have really uh, helped banks understand managing their risks. Um, and, you think, and you said that our banking system is strong and resilient. Um, given these enhancements to resiliency and resolvability, would it be appropriate uh, to re-examine the calculation of the GSIB surcharge since it was originally formulated in 2015 prior uh, to the aforementioned improvements? I think that the overall level of, <clears throat> of our capital, particularly at the largest firms, is about right. I'm, uh, I'm open to evidence that, uh, that there are problems with that. I don't see U.S. banks having difficulty competing, particularly internationally. They seem to be competing very well. They seem to be profitable. They seem to, their, their stock prices seem to be fine. So, uh, but um, in terms of the, the, the surcharge in particular, though, it's, it's one of a bunch of pieces, but I would say the overall level, I think, is, is just about right. I appreciate your testimony. Thank you. The gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Kasten, is uh, recognized for five minutes. <clears throat> thank, thank you, Chairwoman. Uh, thank you, Chairman Powell. Um, you mentioned in your, in your introductory remarks that a, um, a significant amount of the recent growth we've seen is due to consumer spending and business investment. And I'd like to focus on the second of those and specifically on the, on the impact of energy prices. I um, want to read a couple quotes from you to a, to a recent article. Um, the chief economist at UBS Securities has said that the, the increase in oil prices was responsible for much of the rebound in fixed investment in 2017, <clears throat> noting specifically how oil and gas shale plays have, have now make us very dependent on the price of oil to drive U.S. fixed investment. Um, Alexander Arnon of the Penn Wharton budget model has gone on further to say that firmer oil prices accounted, quote, for almost all of the growth in investment in 2018. The article goes on to mention how several of the, the Fed offices have been concerned with the softening of oil prices and what it reflects. First question is, do you agree that the, that the rise in oil prices over the, over the prior year and a half have been a meaningful contributor to capital investment in the United States? Yes. As oil prices go up, that makes it more economic for, for more drilling, and you see more capex. I, okay. I don't know that it accounts for <clears throat> um, certainly that was very much the case in 17. I'd want to go back and look at 18. I, th I thought that capex went up more broadly in 18. Okay. Well, the, the oil prices certainly started to fall, you know, late last year. I think from 70 dollars, and now they're down in the the 40s or so, I believe. The you had mentioned in your forward growth forecast that you expect inflation to be lower than planned, in part because energy costs are down, and so you're, you're sort of adjusting for energy there. Does that not apply in reverse, that if we were looking at prior growth being higher, are we treating energy cost fluctuation the same when we look at basic explanations of prior growth as we are when we're discounting inflation growth going forward because of energy price volatility going the other direction? I'm sorry, I didn't get your question. Say that again. So if I understood your commentary right, you were saying that going forward, inflation is going to be below target, but that's largely driven by energy. And if I'm following what's written here, the prior growth was driven in part by energy prices being more positive. So are we treating the impact of energy prices on the economy the same in a positive direction as we are in a negative direction? Yes, yes, we are. Sorry. Uh, so... You know, if, if prices, if oil prices are, are flat, then they're not adding anything to inflation. And if they grow at two percent, so if that's why we have core, we ex obviously exclude energy and food because they're volatile. We look through to the to the are, core for that reason. Are we also factoring in the impact of those prices on business investment? More broadly, yes, absolutely. Um, I'd, uh, Chair, I'd ask for unanimous consent to enter this article this, into the uh, into the record. Um, my Without objection. 
My, my final question is, I just, uh, I just came here from a, I'm bouncing between two hearings today um, in the science committee about ocean sea level rise, and again ties to the energy markets. The, I listened to scientists explain how over the course of the next century and much sooner than that, based on current CO2 levels and based on current temperatures, we have very realistic expectations of three to eight feet of sea level rise um, with fairly significant impacts on you know, the elimination of coastal communities, the collapse of housing, and significant migration inland. As we think about financial markets going forward, and in particular 30-year mortgages, are we factoring that into the value? And when I put that question to them, they said that the question they would ask is, there's going to be a significant diminution of that value long before the houses are flooded because it's going to be pretty obvious what's coming. My question is, you think about forward rates and, and, and how we think about housing policy in general. How should we be thinking about what at this point is largely inexorable? It's a, it's a good question. We, <clears throat> so we don't, in our supervision of financial institutions, we, we do take into account for example, if you're a bank that's lending, that's in the Gulf area, let's say, and you're, you're subject to, to, to climate events, or not climate events, but weather events and, and uh, natural disasters, then we're going we're gonna to supervise you to make sure that you have, you know, the ability to understand and manage those risks as part of your business. That's how it enters into, that's how this, this subject enters, enters into our work. Um, I, I think in terms of broader macroeconomic consequences, it's, it's hard to do it because it's such a long run. You're talking about climate change, right? So well, my, my, my question is the interest rate on a 30-year mortgage in an area that is on the coast and in any reasonable scenario may well be underwater before that mortgage is, is fully recovered. Yeah. I'm, you know, we, again, we, we, we supervise our banks to, to have them take into account that risk of having, you know, uh, but okay. do we have it exactly right? I'm sure we don't. Thank you, Chairman. The gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Tipton, is recognized for five minutes. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Chairman Powell, good to see you again. Uh, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce released a report this last fall that found that bank lending to small businesses has not kept up with the needs of the economy, suggesting <clears throat> that small business loans remain down 13 percent from 2008. Uh, the report goes on to point out that several regulatory actions have contributed to the slow growth in the small business loans and particularly pinpoints that U.S. regulators have imposed substantially more stringent standards on our largest institutions than what's required under the Basel III international standards. As a former small business owner out of Colorado, I can testify that the ability of a small business to be able to access capital is vital not only in my district but nationwide. As you've acknowledged, the banking system today is well capitalized, highly liquid, and there have been significant imp improvements to the risk management and resolvability. Given that, wouldn't it be appropriate to recalibrate some of the international standards that have been gold-plated in the U.S. so that the excess capital tied up by those regulations can be deployed back into the economy to support small businesses and our consumers? As I, as I mentioned, I think that the capital levels we have in our, in our banks are about right, and I'm, I'm open to evidence that, uh, that that's not the case, but I do see our banks competing successfully and being profitable, uh, and also being resilient to the eventual downturns that will inevitably come. So I think I'd like to see more, more evidence um, before, we, before we start lowering capital standards. I, I, think we'll, I think we ought to hold them where they are for now. Okay. Well, I appreciate your comments on that. It's kind of my understanding that we've not only met but exceeded under federal regulations the Basel standards. Our European counterparts have not been the same. And the goal is, is to be able to make sure that we're keeping the robust economy and, and gr job growth going and uh, opportunity and hope is something that you'll continue to keep in mind. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we've talked a lot today about uh, some of the CECL requirements that are going to be coming into place with the accounting method. And, I do want to be able to express that I've heard concerns that implementation will be expensive and that inevitable mistakes uh, are going to be made after the implementation that will also be expensive. Uh, I've also heard concerns about how CECL standards will interact with the ongoing stress testing. 
Uh, Mr. Chairman, with the implementation of CECL on the horizon, is the Fed preparing to incorporate CECL into its supervisory stress, stress tests uh, before it applies it to all banks in 2022? I, I think the answer is we're, we're not in, incorporating CECL, uh, at least for the next couple of cycles in, uh, in the stress test. The stress tests are already forward-looking. Of course, they, they have forward-looking losses that are, that are assumed to happen. So uh, eventually we will incorporate it, but, but not for the time being. Uh, do you feel that the regulators are well positioned, giving some of the implementations and inevitably some of the challenges that are going to come out of that implementation to be able to respond in a, in a timely manner? To respond to? Uh, some of the challenges that are going to be faced by the costs and the implementation of CECL. Are they going to be uh, able Cecil. to respond? Sorry. Um, yes, I do. I think we're, you know, we're, we're alert uh, to what we're hearing. And um, we're, again, we've, we've, we've put We've given our institutions a three-year phase-in period so they can, and they've, had, they've also had some years to study and understand it, and, um, you know, we've worked with smaller institutions so they know they don't have to have a, you know, a Department of CECL implementation, try to get that done in an inefficient way. Great. Well, I appreciate that, and I know that you're going to be keeping an eye on it, and I uh, would like to encourage you uh, just for the impacts potentially on the industry and on our economy, just to monitor the subject. Uh, Mr. Chairman, in your testimony, you did also note something that's uh, important for my part of the world. Uh, there's a noticeably lower employment rate in terms of the communities in rural areas compared to the urban areas, and that gap has widened over the past decade. Has the post-crisis regulatory environment for community financial institutions impacted job mm -hmm. creations in rural communities? I don't think that's really the story. Um, uh, it seems to be more loss of manufacturing jobs. If you read the, the box, there, there really isn't. Um, I wish there were a clear answer at the end of the box. You get there and it says, okay, here's, here's why and here's what we can do about it. It's not that simple. So essentially the unemployment rates in, in rural communities and metropolitan areas haven't diverged that much. What, what's diverged is labor force participation. And it seems to be, it possibly could be tied to lower education levels in rural areas, but that doesn't seem to explain much of the difference. It may be that it's more about loss of manufacturing, which is more likely to take place away from metropolitan areas. We're still looking at why, but it's, you know, it's a significant disparity that emerged really after the crisis. And if you go back, go back a ways, rural areas had higher participation and lower unemployment. So uh, it's, a, it's a curious development and one that we're, we're calling to your attention and, and trying to understand. You'll back. Gentlewoman from California is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Powell, thank you for being here today with us and for your patience during what I know is a long hearing. Um, I wanted to ask you about the um, hedge fund working group that the Financial Stability Oversight Council, FSOC, formed a few years ago. Um, can you describe whether this working group is actually, in fact, doing any work um, and the nature of that work and when we can expect to see any work product? It's been a little over two years since we've had any um, information from that working group, and I would like to see its results and what it's doing. I'll have to look into that for you. I'm, I'm sure that we have a number of staff who work full-time with, uh, with the FSOC part-time at least with the FSOC, and I can come back to you on that. I don't personally know what that working group is doing. Okay, so in your role as a member of FSOC, I would appreciate your following up with that working Glad group to. and brief, getting a briefing for yourself and sharing it when you can on what they're doing. Um, as you know, no banks failed last year. Um, the period in American history when the nation went the longest without a single bank failure was across 32 months from 2004 to 2007 just before the financial crisis. Then we had three banks collapse in 2007, 25 failed in 2008, 140 failed in 2009, and 157 banks failed in 2010. Since the FDIC was created in 1933, until that run up in the financial crisis in 20, 2004, not a single calendar year had passed without a bank failing. Do you agree that a long stretch without any bank failures can lull the public and even financial mar market experts and regulators such as yourself into a false sense of security? 
I, I think really we're talking about human nature here, so yes, I do think so. I would, I would say, though, if I may add, that um, the banking system is now so much better capitalized and more resilient than it was, and we've, we've made sure to kind of allow for that, uh, that aspect of human nature, I think, by, by making a system that's much more resilient to shocks. So I appreciate your point about the importance of making sure the system is correctly capitalized, but uh, is the Fed not reducing loss-absorbing capital requirements for <clears throat> big banks? No, we're not. And have you changed the capital holding requirements and the leverage ratios and the measures of this, and the, the measures that are used in the stress tests, especially for banks that are under the two hundred fifty billion dollar threshold? I think I think overall we've raised capital standards. We've effectively doubled the amount of capital in the largest institutions. And since when? Since before the crisis. Oh, okay, so I'm speaking about. In the most recent couple of years, what has the direction been generally in terms of capital holding? It's been to, to, to hold capital right where it is. I think we, we, we the, the Fed's view has always been that we, we, we don't want the leverage ratio to be the binding. We want it to be a high and hard backstop. We don't want it to be binding. And it had become binding at its current level, so we lowered it a bit. The actual amount of capital that will leave the system, including the, the holding companies, is, is very, very small. So, in fact, in, in the most recent couple of years, we have, in your view, moderately reduced it's, it's the capital de minimis. holding requirements. It's actually de minimis. Okay. But we are going slowly, somewhat down. Um, no, I, I, I like to see that. I, I think we're, we're holding the level where it is. We, the, the leverage requirement, it's le far less than 1% of capital. It's a, it's a relatively tiny amount of capital that leaves the system. Some of it can leave the bank to go to other parts of the holding company, but it doesn't get out of the holding company. And from other than that, we're we're absolutely holding the line on on capital. Uh, that's it's not in our it's not in our thinking that capital levels are too high. And with regard to stress testing, which is one of the ways that we assess a risk, um, has the my understanding is that the Fed has recently advanced proposals to reduce the stress testing standards. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that's right now. What can you describe then for the, for me and for the committee? What have been the changes, so, and then maybe we can characterize them differently. But I'd love to hear from you um, about that. You know, we are um, we've tried to improve transparency. Uh, without, um, I mean, the, the the whole idea of a stress test is it should be stressful and in some sense surprising, and the, the scenarios change every year and that kind of thing. At the same time, we've tried to be more transparent about about the way we look at losses and that kind of thing. I think. The banks make the point that, um, you know, this is our binding capital requirement for the biggest banks, and we, we ought to have some transparency in, in terms of what it's going to be so that our own capital isn't volatile year to year. So we've tried to address those concerns, but without undermining safety and soundness and without, without li at all limiting the bindingness of the stress tests. Okay. Thank you very much. I yield the remainder of my time. <clears throat> The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Williams, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. And, uh, uh, Chairman, thank you for coming to the committee today. We always appreciate you here. And I like, I've gone, always started asking the witnesses they come before us if they're socialists or capitalists. And uh, I can adjust my questions accordingly when I hear that. But with you, I know what you are. You're a strong capitalist, and I appreciate you for that. Uh, briefly, I'm going to touch on, I'm, I'm, as you probably remember, I'm, I'm a car dealer. I've been in the car business for 50 years, and tariffs have us really concerned right now, but beside tariffs, which you have no control over, we're concerned about interest rates. Uh, I come back from a 20 percent. I was in business at 20 percent, so I know what interest rates can do, and in my lifetime, 6 percent's always been a good rate. The problem is today, balances of the cost of goods sold are, are very high, much higher than they were in 81 at 20 percent, and we, uh, we can, we're, we're concerned about interest rates. Sometimes you can tweak the interest rate a little bit, and it could... It could change a person's payment on a car or whatever, 50 bucks, it could put them out of the market. And we're a consumption-driven nation, and uh, people want to buy. So I merely take advantage of you being here today to just ask you to be generous and or be careful uh, when you start raising the interest rates because uh, it can affect the economy. And in my business, if people can't buy, we cut orders, and we cut orders. The plant has to lay people off and so forth. So it does trickle down. So interest rates are a real concern that we have, at the, all of us that finance inventories. And I appreciate you being uh, gentle to us when you consider raising those rates. Uh, number two, uh, we need to reward people for going back to work. Uh, we need to get more people contributing to the economy, and we cannot have our citizens 
making rational economic decisions to stay on the sidelines of this booming economy because our government is paying them to do so. Uh, the, the monetary policy report says that the labor force participation, which we've talked about today, uh, grew by only one, uh, only one fourth of a percentage point since June, even though there are 7.3 million job openings. So my question to you is, are we creating an economy that encourages people to sit in the dugout rather than uh, get out and play the game? Well, clearly we have a problem with labor force participation, and I think there, there are a range of opinions for, and views and research about why that is. I, I do think there are some uh, disincentives to work. For example, if you, it's, not, it's not that our benefits are, are that generous, but it, it is that in some cases you lose all of your benefits when you go back to work. And so it becomes a pay cut, in effect, even though the benefits themselves are, are, have lost value in real terms over time. So that's an important thing. I also think it's just, it's, it's people with low, with relatively low education and skills. It's a lot of young males. It's certainly opioids. It's a, low labor force participation is a function of many things, but many things that I think would be able to be addressed by the kinds of things that, that Congress can do, as opposed to what, what we can do. We can, we can run a, a strong labor economy, and I think we have that now, but to sustain that over time, it needs more active measures. Well, I can tell you as an employer, we're looking for people to work. There's no question about it. Yeah. Next question. It seems like some of my colleagues on this committee believe that banks bringing in more profits is a bad thing. Well, just because we can't turn a profit up here in this business it doesn't mean that the private industry has to suffer along with us. Uh, when a bank is more profitable, uh, there is more money to lend to small businesses like me and hire more people like we do and ultimately grow our nation's uh, GDP. We've got a slide that keeps popping up there that says uh, record profits for banks. Well, I personally think that's a good slide. We should show that more. So, Chairman Powell, do you believe that a sector's profitability uh, should be used as justification for more regulation? I think it's important for businesses to be profitable. It's a good thing. And, and for banks, it's how you accumulate capital. It's, uh, it's the reward for servicing your companies, your, your customers well. Yeah, profit is not a dirty word. never has been. Uh, next question, we need our economy to let the private sector continue to build wealth for individuals. And the government, the people in government don't understand the government can, cr can help create a job, but it's the private sector that creates net worth. <clears throat> and the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act took a big step in allowing businesses uh, to keep more of their hard-earned money and invest it in how they see fit. The other major step that was taken last Congress was the passage of uh, 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 Senate Bill 2155, which will continue uh, to roll back the over the burdensome regulations that have been hurting small businesses in Main Street for years. They're finally seeing a little, a little respite and they're able to do business. So do you believe the Federal Reserve has been coordinating effectively with the other federal regulators to implement this much needed regulatory relief bill? I do. Uh, we, um, you know, we are implementing it. Um, we're, we have a lot of resources and there's a lot to do under 2155, as you know, and, and it's, as I mentioned yesterday, it's our highest priority. It's the biggest thing we're working on right now. Just a Thank you for being here, and I yield my time back. Thank you very much, and I'm pleased you like a slide. Um, the next person that we have up is the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Garcia, for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the committee. Um, Chairman Powell, uh, when you served as uh, governor overseeing the uh, reserve banks, you sent the reserve banks an annual letter suggesting candidates from a range of labor and community groups. Why do you think it is that your suggestions have largely been ignored? And why is the Fed still sluggish in choosing and electing class B and C directors from backgrounds outside of business and the Wall Street community? Actually, I think, uh, Congressman, I think we've made pretty good progress there. We now have, I guess, it's 24, I think, um, community interest, community group people, and I think six, um, six of the reserve banks have a person from labor on the, on the board. So we've made real progress there. And I, I think also, I think our, our record on diversity for the BNC directors is actually an excellent one and, and a record that I'm proud of. In the last five or six years, we've really made quite big strides there. Well, Chicago, for one, I think has been uh, a leader uh, in that regard. Uh, the Chicago Fed uh, has one of the most diverse boards, uh, is now the, as 
I understand, the only reserve bank to have one director from a labor background, one director from an academic background, and one director from a community organization on its board. As a matter of fact, uh, two women who happen to be African American and one Latino uh, comprise uh, that diversity in Chicago. Have you spoken with anyone in Chicago, uh, at the Chicago uh, Fed, about how they've been able to pass other reserve banks in racial and occupational diversity, and if so, what are the best practices that they've shared? And I meant surpass, not pass. Um, so we, we have an office that deals with the reserve banks around this particular issue. Um, and I think that I actually would say that the progress across the reserve banks has been quite broad. I know that the, I, the statistic you're referring to is including an academic as well, and not, there are not as many academics. Also, with many labor people, um, you have to give up all political activity to go on our board. I think that's hard for a lot of senior labor people, so it's a challenge for us to find labor. Still, we do, though, and we focus very hard on doing that. Um, so, yes, we talked to Chicago, but, I mean, I, I wouldn't want to... I wouldn't want to say the other banks haven't made good progress, too. I believe they have. Thank you. Um, on the uh, subject of uh, mergers and uh, market uh, concentration, uh, switching gears briefly, last year the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency issued an advance notice of proposed rulemaking around the uh, Community Reinvestment Act. Fourteen state attorneys general, including the former Illinois Attorney General, uh, issued a public comment on the OCC's proposal expressing concern that the proposal might soften the conditions mm -hmm. under which uh, a bank's violations of consumer protections, uh, protection laws would cause it to be downgraded. According to the attorneys general, quote, such a minor downgrade will not impact regulators' review uh, of their mergers and acquisitions. The only real stick for the CRA uh, compliance. Do you share the concern that these attorneys general expressed that the rare circumstances where the Fed presently steps in to interfere is a merger, in a merger might be undermined by the OCC's proposal? I, um, I wouldn't want to comment on the OCC's on that proposal, but I'll just say we haven't changed our policy on CRA and mergers, and it, it still is that we, we, it's one of the things we look at, and uh, we, want, we want companies to have satisfactory or outstanding CRA ratios who, who, are, who are presenting merger, merger applications. On the uh, merger review, is it correct that about 97% of all mergers are approved and that over the past decade, approximately 450 such mergers have been approved. Do you expect that to rise even more so? Gentleman's time has expired. May I respond, Madam Chair? Yes, you may. Sorry. Um, I thought it was going like this. I have to look at the numbers. I, so um, we, many merger proposals are withdrawn when we raise questions about them. Um, we don't most often you don't wind up actually turning down a proposal. You, people just withdraw it because they can see it's not going to be approved. So, and there's a, there's a fair amount of that. It's way more than 3%, I believe. So, Do they withdraw because of CRA? They withdraw because they know the, yes, I mean, among other Compliance. things. Compliance? Well, they, they, they withdraw because they can see that, that this is either going to take a really long time or probably not going to be a successful effort. So, or, or for other reasons. But, but in any case... Um, we haven't changed our policy on CRA. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, for your indulgence. I yield. <clears throat> Thank you. The gentleman from Arkansas is recognized for five minutes, Mr. Hill. Chairman Powell, welcome back to the committee. We're delighted to have you. Thank you for your steady hand on the tiller of monetary policy at the Fed, and we're grateful for all the time you spent on both sides of the Hill answering our questions. I want to follow up on uh, my friend from Kentucky, Mr. Barr's uh, line of questioning on the balance sheet. And again, just looking for some detail as you look at the normalization process. I noted that the balance sheet was down about $368 billion January to January, or about 9% reduction. And if you think about uh, the size of the economy and your comments that you've made about uh, the future balance sheet size, 
it occurred to me that um, if, just for discussion purposes, the Fed balance sheet was down at 10 percent of GDP, <clears throat> so $2 trillion in, in theory, as opposed to the 6 or 7 percent it was before the financial crisis, that at this rate it would take about five years to normalize in that range. And as you began to think about the balance sheet, have you all, that would be about 16 years after the financial crisis that the balance sheet would be normalized. Have you, if you look at the uh, uh, rolling off of the portfolio, what, what range of, of years do you think it would, would reach? I know it's, it's uh, I'm looking for some range of the denominator. Uh, so um, the level of demand for our liabilities, principally reserves, and currency, but also the Treasury general account, which is a place where Treasury keeps cash, more cash than they used to, and also the designated financial market utilities keep their rainy day cash there. The d demand for those liabilities is so much higher that we're actually not very far from the level of that demand. And, and our estimates of the demand, particularly for reserves among the large banking institutions, have gone up quite a lot just over the last the course of the last couple of years. So in, in terms of years, I actually think you know, we're, I, I think we're going to be in a position, we're working on a plan, in fact, to stop runoff later this year. We may still be a bit above equilibrium demand for reserves, but we, you know, uh, we're, we're not looking to limit the growth of, of, of the other liabilities because we, we think they, they meet important demands from the public. So you're suggesting that, that sometime this year that, you, that you'd have uh, on the asset side, you'd stop uh, letting the securities roll off? That's right, and so that'll be about 16, 17 percent of GDP, whereas it was 6 percent before. Yep. And the difference really is currency is a bigger part of um, currency when you, of GDP, and the same thing with reserves. When you look at the composition, I know you've testified, and Vice Chairman Quarles says too, that you prefer a Treasury-only balance sheet, and you've heard discussions in this committee previously <laughs> where we recognize in periods of crisis that the Fed might take other assets, but that many of us believe they should have swapped those back out over at the Treasury so that the central bank only maintains a Treasury portfolio. You still hold that view, and what's your view of Mr. Quarles' comments last week that he would look at limited sales of the CMBS portfolio? We have said that we want primarily a Treasury uh, balance sheet. Um, we've also said that we hold the possibility out there that at some point, and this isn't something we've decided, it's not something in the near term, we would, we would do limited sales of MBS to hasten that process along. I think where we are with the balance sheet is we, we have a bunch of decisions to make, and the, the one on MBS sales is probably closer to the back of the line. Really, we have to decide about the maturity composition and things like that. We'll be working through that in a very careful way. Markets are sensitive to this, so. Yeah, I know mark, the markets would certainly connect with those sales would be, and I think that I would encourage that. I want to switch uh, gears and talk about um, uh, another UK issue that's not Brexit, and that is the subject of open banking, the UK's payment uh, services mm -hmm. directive, uh, which is also termed informally as open banking. and. I'd like to get, uh, if, if not your thoughts today, get your thoughts in writing about the promise of open banking as benefits for com more competition. And uh, this is where consumers have access to all their data, brokerage banking, that they get to control. It's a way to have better data security and more consumer security. It's been required now of the major banks in the UK. Are you familiar at all with that? And, and I'm not familiar with, with the UK aspect of it. I'm familiar with the fact that it's a very interesting and important issue here. I think as we look at fintech uh, in our markets and as we look at ways to level the, the uh, competitive playing field between the GCFEs and everybody else, this will be an emerging issue, and I'd invite your comments in the future about right. that. Thank you. Thank you. Yield back. <clears throat> Thank you. The gentleman from New York, Mr. Zeldin, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and uh, thank you to Chairman Powell. Uh, you have been a, a great resource for, uh, for and very open and, and transparent for um, my inquiries uh, recently in, in my office just a couple weeks back. And I just want to thank you for um, how available you are uh, for concerns of uh, this committee and members of Congress. You've been great. I wanted to uh, follow up on the 2016 heist of 81 million from Bangladesh's central bank, which exploited vulnerabilities in the New York Fed's fraud detection process. 
According to a 2016 investigation, Reuters concluded that, quote, inertia and clumsiness at the New York Fed was a key factor in the <clears throat> theft of these funds. I understand that the New York Fed established a hotline for global banks following the heist, but could you provide us with an update on additional measures the Fed has taken to rectify the problems identified in the Bangladesh case? And are you confident that the Fed would prevent any payments if a similar hack uh, was attempted in the future? I, I think this, the, the Fed, the New York Fed, and central banks all over the world, frankly, were, were very struck by that event and have, um, and we, there have been action at the international level to look at principles and, and things we can do. And so I think we've, we've tried to harden our systems to that kind of a fraud where someone actually gets control of, of, a, of another central bank and starts to, and, and is able to, in, in effect, in, pretend to be that central bank and, and try to withdraw dollar reserves. So I think we've, we've, we've worked hard on that problem. We've also tried to imagine other ways that, that the system can be invaded in that way. So it's something we, we've put a lot of resources in. Uh, over the course of today's hearing, uh, you've received a lot of questions, um, a lot of comments. Is there uh, anything, I, I have uh, some available, uh, available time left. Is there anything that uh, you're looking to clear up with any available time or what else? Think clear up? No, I'm no. Um, great. Well, thank you for open mic, you know. But yeah. will the go. gentleman yield? Um, Madam Chairwoman. Yes. If the gentleman would yield. Yes, ma'am. I will help you to uh, uh, <laughs> pose some more questions to the chairman. Uh, would you ask him uh, if you yield? Well, I'll ask him if you're yielding to me. If you will expound more on the stress test, uh, it has come up, and I alluded to it when I opened. Um, and I am worried that uh, what you are recommending will basically um, create the kind of transparency where you're giving banks the answers ahead of time. And that's not what was intended in Dodd-Frank. Would you help us with that? Sure. Um, so we think stress testing is probably the most successful post-crisis regulatory uh, innovation, and we absolutely intend to preserve stress testing as a key pillar of post-crisis regulation, especially for the very large financial institutions. Um, I think uh, we, the idea that we would give them our actual models is, is not a good idea for a couple of reasons. One, that really would be showing, this, in effect, giving away the test. But uh, in addition, I think it would, it would create real incentives for banks to kind of stop thinking about the way about risk on their own and kind of rely on our thinking about risk and our loss rates, rates estimates. We want them to model their own risks and not use our models. And of course, we want to check it with our models. So, so we've stopped way short of that, but we have provided more transparency, and I think appropriately so. I think in, uh, you know, in our system of government, we owe a level of transparency to the, uh, to the public, and I think we've tried to strike the right balance. Madam Chairwoman, uh, kindly, if I could uh, reclaim my time, I'd, I'd like to yield to uh, the ranking member, Mr. McHenry. Thank you. Thank you. Along those same lines, uh, the living will process and the stress test process, I, I agree, has had a beneficial impact. Uh, the complaint I've heard from those that have to submit uh, uh, to the stress test is, uh, is they don't get any feedback. It's pass or fail. Everything's on the line. And they hear when the public hears, and they pass or don't, and that's all they hear. So what's the feedback you're giving them? on this measure to, to the uh, chairwoman's sa similar question. Um, in, in her view, you're lessening the burden. Uh, in my view, you're, you're better communicating with those people you're seeking to get information from. So wh where, how do you see that? So I, my, I guess my sense was, and I'll, I'll go back to the office and, and uh, look into this, but my sense was there's, there's actually a, quite a lot of, of feedback, for example, at the, at the staff level and also above the staff level. For example, if you have a, one particular business that's important to you, then we're going to look at the risk models and we're going to be evaluating them and see that they're capturing evolving risks and that kind of thing. And a lot of that kind of thing comes out in their stress test and in our feedback. Thank you. The gentleman's time uh, has expired. Um, the gentleman from Guam, um, Mr. San Nicholas, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, um, Chairman Powell, for being with us today. Uh, in a prior setting, um, I, I posited the question with respect to um, uh, interest rate policy and how it can be applied uh, to various, uh, various size companies. 
and um, I want to, I guess, um, re, uh, reinitiate the inquiry, uh, but first begin by, by, by kind of laying the foundation for why I'm posing the question. Uh, the Fed has a dual mandate to um, stabilize prices and, and provide for maximum employment. Uh, but when we pursue interest rate policy that applies uh, across the board to all institutions equally, um, sometimes we may be carving into one at the expense of the other. Uh, for example, um, community banks and smaller financial institutions um, don't have the, uh, the same employment uh, uh, figures necessarily as those, uh, those areas that are more commonly served by the quote-unquote big banks. Um, in the more rural areas that are serviced by community banks, you will find um, that the unemployment figures are higher than they are uh, when you factored against the national average. Um, on the other hand, um, when it comes to price stability and, and using interest rates to try and uh, uh, reduce the amount of uh, capital in, in the economy, uh, the big banks are the ones that are more pervasive in terms of uh, the consumer credit that they issue on a, on a net basis. And so if we were to, uh, for example, uh, raise rates to, uh, to try and stabilize prices, that rate increase would apply to both community banks and big banks, um, thereby reducing the, um, the uh, uh, lendability of the community banks the same way that they would um, impact the, um, the bigger banks. But what that would do is it would exacerbate the employment circumstances in the rural areas um, while also containing the prices uh, on, the, um, on the big bank areas. Uh, and so my question that I posited in a, in a prior setting um, that I'd like to uh, put on the record here today is whether or not the Fed would consider bifurcating interest rate policy um, uh, to consider uh, a different uh, interest rate policy with respect to community banks or smaller institutions and the areas they serve versus the larger institutions and the more broad stroke that they have on the overall financial system. And uh, just to kind of tie up my question, um, again, in our previous setting, I mentioned that uh, uh, the contagion risk, the systemic risk um, that community banks pose are more uh, diluted versus the uh, systemic risk that our, our big banks present. And so uh, that also just kind of puts into my mind the, the fact that uh, an interest rate policy that uh, looks at both um, service areas a little differently um, might actually um, help to not only improve employment numbers, but to do so in rural areas that are dragging down the overall average, and to do so in a way that may not necessarily impact um, pricing pressures because it's not an across-the-board uh, an across-the-board uh, rate policy. So, um, could you please share your thoughts on, on the idea of perhaps bifurcating interest rate policy between larger institutions and smaller institutions? It's an interesting interesting question. Um, I think it would be uh, it would not, of course, be in keeping with uh, with the tradition of interest rates, which is it, it, our policy rate is a it, it applies to the whole economy, and we don't get into distinguishing between different borrowers and that kind of thing. I, I wouldn't want to see us going down that road. That's more for you, you know, to distinguish um, uh, between different entities in, in, under the law. But I I, I think. Um, Again, I wouldn't want to see us going down the road of, of raising rates, different amounts on different people in different different sectors. I think the interest rate is a blunt tool. Remember that we're not elected. We're, we're you know we have we're not supposed to be um, we're supposed to be with interest rates uh, just operating at the national level, and I think that's probably a healthy thing. Well, I appreciate your feedback, but I mean, when we, when we get back to the question of the mandates of the Fed, the mandates are very clear: um, stabilize prices, maximize employment. But if the variables that are impacting both are different with respect to the institution sizes and the interest rates as they apply to them, um, we may be uh, unnecessarily impacting employment in, in pockets of the country um, by taking a broad stroke approach on interest rates with respect to uh, the pursuit of price stability, for example. And so um, while I, I don't encourage the Fed to necessarily pick and choose, um, if we were to um, have the Fed consider growing and evolving its mandate in a way that's using the available data that's out there to be able to target the employment areas um, that are typically uh, more exacerbated in the, in the community or rural bank places um, while also pursuing an interest rate policy of, of price stability that's more so impacted by the bigger banks, I think that that's something that will be worthy of consideration. So I just wanted to put it on the record. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I yield back. <clears throat> the gentleman from Georgia, uh, Mr. Latimer, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Chairman Powell, uh, for sitting through this again. Uh, uh, 
I've got several issues I want to touch on, but uh, first of all, something you and I have spoken about uh, privately and something that uh, Mr. Lukemeyer brought up being Cecil. Um, you know, I've emphasized my concern. He's, he's uh, expressed his concerns about the potential impact it would have um, <clears throat> on our economy. We don't, first of all, I appreciate the, the numbers that you brought forward to us, the strength of our economy, this, the, the incredible uh, economic expansion and the long-term expansion we've seen. These are all, this is good news, good news for everybody in the country and all demographics. Um, we don't want to do anything to suppress that at all. One of the, the grave concerns that the manufacturers have in my district, which was surprising to me as I met with them, and, and I asked their concerns, of course, um, it, trade is always a concern with them, uh, but their number one concern was the lack of single-family homes, uh, entry-level homes, uh, that the, the large number of employees they're bringing in have a place to, uh, to buy, to enter into the housing market. So I would just reemphasize the concern that we've had is we uh, would love to see a, an offset in capital requirements uh, with Cecil to make sure it doesn't suppress this great economic gain that, that we've made. Um, but to move on to, to some issues, I, as you and I have spoke, I have an IT background and I also represent Georgia, which is uh, about two thirds of the payment processors across the nation. And so I know that the Fed has, um, is uh, exploring the possibility of getting into the, uh, the, the, the payment business and uh, uh, especially with the real-time payment network. My question, and I haven't fully uh, developed an opinion on this, but I'm, I'm very hesitant whenever the, the federal government engages in any practice that competes with the private sector. Um, my first question would be, if you do establish a real-time uh, payments network, is it appropriate for you to continue serving as the regulator for the private sector of which you would be competing with. We do have some instances where we, where we operate, for example, ACH, and there's another ACH operator. I think, though, um, um, it's, it's a fair question, and we, you know, we, we do hold ourselves to, to a, a big standard in that. It's not a, by the way, it's not a payments network, really. It's a settlement system. We're really, only the central bank can provide mm -hmm. real final settlement, settlement in immediately available funds. The private sector can provide that to to some, but it's 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 actually on its own it's on its own books. It's a little bit different approach. Okay, and one of the things that you've uh, you've indicated with the request for comment that if you do implement the system, it would be fully compatible with the the private sector networks. Yes. What have you done to ensure that this would be the case? That it would be fully compatible? Well, we we just will have to do that. That's that's an undertaking that we've made. We we haven't. You know, we haven't right. decided to do this yet, so, um, but if we do it, it will absolutely be fully compatible. Is there any thought of, once you establish that of this eventually privatizing? I hadn't, hadn't thought of that. Okay. Um, I, I'm a big fan of privatization, and as, as uh, Mr. Williams pointed out, you're a capitalist. I'm, I'm a strong proponent of the free market and competition, but also I'm very hesitant when the government who regulates a certain area competes in it as well. Uh, one of the other areas I'd like to, to uh, ask you a question about is, first of all, um, I appreciate all the work that you've done in tailoring the proposal for regional banks under S2155. Um, when will the Fed produce a rule on tailoring prudential regulations for U.S. subsidiaries of foreign-owned banks? So we're, we're working on that, and I do think that's something we, I believe, uh, expect to get done pretty shortly here. Is there a reason why it's taken so long? It's just complicated, and we have, I think we've done a dozen rulemakings under uh, 2155. It's, it's, uh, it's, there are just a lot of things in the law, it's, uh, but we're, we're working on that one. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the end result, do you think it'll be similar to the proposal for domestic regional banks? Conceptually, we're, we're trying to treat them similarly, yes. Okay. Well, I'd encourage you to move forward as quickly as possible, but not to the point that we don't have a good end product, but also to, to keep our uh, domestic banks uh, in mind. The last question, just a little bit off the cuff, um, regarding cryptocurrency. I know the Securities Exchange Commission one is, is currently regulating it. Do you have any position or thoughts regarding, from a monetary policy standpoint, the impact of cryptocurrency? You know, from a 
it's from a monetary policy standpoint, the implications are not large, certainly in the near term. Um, people are not using cryptocurrencies in large size for payments, for example. Uh, it's really been more of a store of value for some, and you can see that it's highly volatile, so I, I think it's not, uh, it's not attracting a lot of success there. We can, we can talk about it more offline. Okay, thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired. Um, the gentleman from uh, North Carolina, Mr. Budd, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and Chairman Powell, I appreciate you being here today for your steady hand and your continued service, so again, thank you. Um, the, back in 2017, the Treasury Department issued a, a series of reports. Uh, they had recommendations for streamlining and improving the regulation of the financial system so that it creates maximum value for American businesses and consumers. Uh, while progress has been made on some of those recommendations, there's still some that even 18 months later, um, they haven't been implemented. So an example of that would be a requirement that banks exchange uh, margin on transactions between their own affiliates, or the inner affiliate margin, I think it's called. Um, it's a requirement that's not imposed over at the CFTC or uh, by international regulators. According to a recent survey, this takes up to about, uh, it ties up about $40 billion in capital with no uh, known benefit and it actually prevents banks from most efficiently managing risk in this area. Last November, Vice Chairman Quarles agreed that the regulators should prioritize this issue and that uh, the agencies have the ability to move into compliance with the rest of the world on this. Uh, can you describe the Fed's uh, plans to implement the Treasury's recommendation uh, with this um, initial margin requirement, um, uh, when it be exempted, and when we might expect this to uh, to get some progress on this. You know, I know it's something we're working on, and I, I don't have a date for you or really a result, but I can, I can come back to you on that. Do you sense, uh, do you have the sense that it's actually a priority? Yes, yes, it's, but it, it, remember, with, with 2155, we have, we have a lot of priorities right now, and okay. that's, that's one which is, you know, certainly under active. It's, it's being worked on actively, I know that. Thank you, appreciate that. I want to switch over to Cecil or the current expected credit loss rule. Uh, a couple of questions on that. Um, as currently structured, uh, a lot of us on both sides of the aisle think that Cecil prevents or presents a major capital volatility risk affecting pricing and ability of lending for 30-year mortgages and to borrowers of lower quality credit, uh, especially during downturns. I, personally, I, I feel that it's pro-cyclical. Um, there have been proposals made that uh, before implementing this major accounting change, there should be a quantitative impact study conducted to look at these concerns. So I worry that this uh, three-year phase-in uh, that the Federal Reserve recently finalized does not address this underlying pro-cyclicality issue. So do you see any harm in conducting such a study, this QIS? You know, I, I think we've, um, I, I can go back and look at that, but I, I think we don't think it'll have that effect, uh, but we're, we're going to be watching very carefully. As I, as so I to do a study on it, would it be reasonable even to do a QIS? I mean, where there's varying opinions uh, among very respected people on this, so a QIS would be reasonable? I, I, so the thing is, I'd have to go back and talk to, to the group on this, but the thing is this, is, this is something we've been working on for 10 years. I think there's been a lot of think, thinking and thought that's gone into it, and um, I, I don't have an answer for you on QIS, but I can get that. Right, but there, right as you stand right now, you don't have any known harms that a study would do. Well, I, I, I don't, sitting okay. here today, but I, I don't know how long it would take, and I'm not sure what we've done on that front. I can check. Sure. I would, I would encourage us just to, to do our homework as much as possible, including a QIS. Thank you. Uh, I want to go back briefly to uh, international insurance uh, regulation and your conversation with Congressman Duffy. Uh, you told Mr. Duffy that you wanted to negotiate something that quote, works for the U.S., so thank you for that, by the way. Uh, this is still just a little bit ambiguous for a lot of us, but there's really only two possible outcomes that you could try to achieve. Uh, either we're trying to reach an agreement that will require the U.S. to adopt some specific changes to our system, or uh, we're trying to have the U.S. system achieve a formal mutual recognition um, that would require no changes to our system of insurance regulation. So do you have a preference which way are you headed? Uh, either we get mutually recognized as is, or are we going to force changes on the system? You know, we're not looking to change the fundamental nature of our insurance system. We think it works well. 
Um, we're also looking to have an international agreement that doesn't that works with our system. So I'm not sure that exactly responds to your question, but we're certainly not looking to say, okay, we've negotiated this deal with this group abroad, and we're going to come back and and and. A, substantially change our insurance regulation system. That's that's not going to happen. So more of a mutual recognition, this is how it works? Yeah, I don't say that. W there may be some things that we take on board which sound like good ideas. I don't, I don't really know uh, the, the, much about the details, but I, I know that we're, you know, we're, we're in very, very close contact all the time with the state supervisors on this. We've had quite a lot of consult on this. And, and, uh, the and gentleman's it, time has expired. Chairman, thank you. I yield back, Chair One. Uh, the gentlewoman from Ohio. Ms. Beatty is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman Waters and Ranking Member McHenry. And thank you, Chairman Powell, for being here today. Uh, you've had a lot of questions thrown at you uh, from monetary and policy and banking and a whole host of things. So I'm going to shift and talk about people for a little bit. I have two questions. The first question is going to be centered around the Federal Reserve's bank board's uh, diversity, and the second is going to be about income equality and the wealth gap. So let me start uh, by saying uh, I want to draw your attention to a report from the Center for Popular Democracy's Fed Up campaign, which conducts an annual analysis of gender, racial, and occupational diversity of the Federal Reserve. And Madam Chairwoman, I'd like to submit this for the record. Without objection. The Federal Reserve Act, as you know, of 1913, uh, in 12 USC uh, 302, that Class B and Class C directors are to be selected to <clears throat> represent the public with, quote, do but not exclusively consideration to the interest of agriculture, commerce, industry, service, labor, and consumers, and without discrimination. However, the, anal the analysis done by this report suggests that the Federal Reserve banks around the country are not representative of the public at all. The report found, quote, that in 2019, among the 108 current federal board directors, 70 percent, 76 percent come from the banking or business sector, 74 percent are white, and 62 percent are male. Additionally, the report found that an overwhelming number of Federal Reserve Bank presidents are overwhelmingly white at 83 percent. The most troubling aspect of the report was what happened just last year. In 2018, the incoming board of directors were 50 percent people of color, 43 percent women, but in 2019, we backslid with incoming directors uh, who were from 82 percent banking or business sector, 75 percent white, and 61 percent male. You have consistently committed to this committee that you are committed to diversity, which I am very appreciative. And, and let me remind you of a quote that you gave. We make better decisions when we have diverse voices around the tables. And that's something we're very committed to at the Federal Reserve. Jerome Powell, you probably remember saying that. So do you have any uh, thoughts uh, on this report? Because I'm concerned that we're losing momentum on this issue that was started by Janet Yellen, your predecessor. And I'm thinking that I may need to expand my legislation to include the Beatty Rule with the Federal Reserve, uh, its pattern after the Rooney Rule, which I'm sure you're also familiar with because we've had dialogue. Do you have any thoughts on that? And because my time is probably going to run out, hold on that. I want you to also address, when asked about the challenges, you did a town hall uh, with regular people. I think it was teachers. And you cited widely shared prosperity and mobility, the opportunity to move from being born into a low quintile of wealth spectrum to the highest. And so as chair of the subcommittee on diversity and inclusion, uh, I am certainly interested in this and would like to know if you can elaborate on what you believe to be one of the top challenges in this economy faces over the next decade as related to diversity and inclusion. Okay, thank you. Um, so I think that uh, my experience over my private sector career and public sector career has been that successful organizations uh, value diversity, value inclusion, uh, value free to speak, and uh, 
and those sorts of things. And that's certainly true at, at the Fed. I really do believe that we get better results to the extent we have diverse perspectives around the table. I feel strongly about that. I've also I've been involved in the selection of Reserve Bank directors now for the really since I joined the board in 2012, and I'm I, I think that we've made very substantial progress there, and I'm proud of the progress that we've made. I think if you look at the numbers over the last five, six, seven years, the number of uh, the uh, the diversity among B and C directors is is actually higher than, than the numbers that, that you read from that report. Let me interrupt you for one second, and that's very true of Chicago, but then when you look at Dallas, it's, it's the direct opposite. I know the numbers at the aggregate level. I, I think of the BNC directors that we currently have, 70% are diverse in one, one dimension or another, and 25% are African American. And these numbers have come way up from where they were seven or eight years ago. Mention, can I, if I can just say a second on the Rooney Rule, we're way past the Rooney Rule. I've, I've been involved in eight selection processes for Reserve Bank presidents, and in every case, we've had multiple diverse candidates, racially diverse, gender diverse, all kinds of diversity. We, we and the Reserve Banks, you know, hire a national search firm, and they go into that. Anyway, sorry. We can I'm talk sorry. later. My time is up. Letters, latest time is expired. Uh, the chairman has a hard stop at one o'clock. We're going to get our last uh, member in, Mr. Davidson. Uh, from Ohio, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Chairman Powell, thank you for your testimony. And I know it's been a, a long stretch there at the mic. Uh, it's an honor to be able to get this question in and several, hopefully. Um, really, with great foresight, uh, Congress has acted uh, at times, and sometimes not so much. One of the things Congress got right was the Telecommunications Act of 1996. And the reality is our economy is so vibrant because it's fostered an amazing amount of innovation. Incredibly, with the Internet, uh, Congress had the foresight to say it is the policy of the United States to preserve the vibrant and competitive free market that presently exists for the Internet and other interactive computer services unfettered by federal or state regulation. That wasn't zero regulation. There was a framework for it. But it was fairly light touch. As we look at the token economy, uh, tokenized assets in the crypto market, um, you know, inherently people think of Bitcoin. And I think of Bitcoin as the first website that you came across. You might like it, you might hate it, but it certainly didn't represent the internet because it was a website. Uh, and Bitcoin doesn't represent blockchain any more than a website represents the internet. Uh, it is one use. But as, uh, as, as our country's kind of been reluctant to provide any regulatory certainty, capital has fled the United States where this innovation uh, initially was off to a good start for other pastors. Do you believe that regulatory certainty could foster increased innovation in this market, in the token economy? Uh, I, I would want to understand that better, but yeah, that, make, that makes sense on its face to me. Yeah, and when you look at consumer protection, for example, the SEC is focused on protecting uh, the securities market, and the concern is, is if everything looks like a security, there's a lack of certainty for investors. And so the Token Taxonomy Act, uh, a bipartisan legislation uh, that would provide that certainty to say, um, if it meets these criteria, then it is, is not a security, is one that we're currently working on and hope to move through this committee in short order. Um, you know, beyond that, obviously the scope of the Federal Reserve uh, has a charter. And earlier in your testimony, you talked about 2% inflation as a target. Uh, here in Congress and around the country in certain sectors, people hear 2% uh, plus or minus zero deviation, certainly no long-term deviation. Um, can you state that or confirm that it's a policy to target precisely 2% or to what extent is there some level of variance for higher or lower inflation? Yes, we say that... Uh inflation that our objective is 2%, but it's a symmetric objective because, of course, in the, in the nature of, a, of an economy, it's never, it, it will rarely be exactly 2.000%. It's going to be a little bit higher. It's going to be a bit, little bit lower as economic activity fluctuates, as oil prices fluctuate, and that right. sort of thing. But and we, over what sort of time horizon do you look at that? Um, well, we, one, one, it is... It is um, Symmetric in the sense that we're always going to be trying to get back to that, and um, you know, you know, these things don't move super quickly. So we will be conducting monetary policy in a way that that um, achieves both of our objectives. We've also got our maximum employment objective. So, 
Right. Um, so. Right, and so in balance and maybe over a longer period than a, a quarter, for yes. example. Yes, right. definitely over a longer period. Okay, and uh, the last time we spoke, uh, we finished talking about trade, and uh, I think it's fitting we finished talking about trade today. I mean, obviously, the United States has become really the world's land of opportunity. We are a great destination for good services, capital, intellectual property, labor, and including people. Um, but um, trade has definitely been... Um, a high point for this current administration. Uh, we've strengthened our trade deals. We're uh, working to strengthen our trade deal with China as we speak. Uh, but there's been a lot of consternation about, about tariffs. Historically, Congress has uh, overall authority for trade, and they've delegated that to the presidency. My concern as we look at 232 tariffs on steel and aluminum, for example, while U.S. steel companies have benefited from higher tariffs with greater profits, their share prices have been destroyed. Uh, and part of that is there, there's no certainty as to how long this tariff's going to last. Um, if we passed a law, whether it was a 25% tariff or a 200% tariff or uh, zero tariff, would the certainty provide uh, better outcomes for the market? I think um, certainty in these matters would be, would be helpful. So toward that end, we've, we're working on the Global Trade Accountability Act. My hope is that can be bipartisan and Congress can eventually... <laughs> Uh, lock in our, our uh, rates and uh, the trade deals that do make trade great again. Uh, thank you, and my time has expired. I yield. appreciate your testimony. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Powell. I'd like to thank you for your testimony today. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions for the witness to the chair, which will be forwarded to the witness for their response. I will ask our witness to please respond as promptly as you are able. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit, submit extraneous materials to the chair for inclusion in the record. And with that, this hearing is adjourned.